and it has a very well. Oh I my just shattered the glass. Go ahead, keep going. Directors Club Podcast. I'm Jim Laskowski, and we have a wonderful returning guest. He's sitting on my couch. Mm-hmm. Seeing as how, I don't know, this. I was thinking about this, this podcast would never have existed or gotten started because, I don't know, he showed up to one of my house shows and was just like, hmm, I really love talking to this guy. He talks more than me, <laughs> and I love what he has to say. So we got in front of microphones and uh, just to this very day, we're still doing it. He's still haunting these very microphones. It's true. It's very true. So uh, I'm grateful that he's here. Patrick, welcome back. Hi, how's it going? Patrick Rapole, the co-host of 96 Greers on the Now Playing Network. That's true. You have a number of podcasts on the Now Playing Network. But that's uh, the most active one currently. For now. We'll see. We'll, I'm, I'm, I'm currently assessing my financial situation and considering how much I want to keep paying $12 a month to keep a podcast that gets four downloads a month uh, on on the internet. So Uptown Song Club might be relegated to the internet archive quite soon. <laughs> that can happen. Yeah. Yeah. I should probably do that to uh, our popcorn supper yeah. show. <laughs> Put that on archive.org. Yeah, just link to an archive.org zip file and be yeah. done with it because no one wants it. I tried, but no one wants it. What have you been up to since we last spoke in January? Oh, gosh. Um, quit my job. Got a new job. Uh... Uh, in the meantime, I watched a bunch of movies. I uh, shocking, yeah. My <laughs> left foot. I watched recently. Oh, really? It's much more interesting than I thought it was going mm. to be. It's a Jim Sheridan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I enjoyed that one. I haven't seen it maybe in twenty years. Yeah, don't remember too much outside of Daniel Day Lewis being great. He's great. He's always great. He's great. The movie is. Way less like uh, misery porn slash inspiration, like disabled inspiration porn than I thought it was going to be. Um, Like the actual filmmaking itself is kind of corny and whatever, but like the uh, approach to the material and Daniel Day-Lewis's performance and which for a a long part of the beginning of the movie, it is a child actor playing the same character. That child actor is also fucking great. Hmm. Unfortunately, this is the point in Lefty Brown's uh, life where uh, Lef- is Lefty Brown the name of the the character? I That's can't recall. A, I, th- I think you're right. Uh, at any rate, this is the point in time where he is nonverbal, so he doesn't have any dialogue. So he doesn't have any of the the great speeches like uh, when uh, Daniel Day Lewis says "fuck Plato," platonic love. Uh, <laughs> um, but like as a pure physical performance, the kid they get mm. is incredible as well. But uh, yeah, that's what I've been up to. I've watched my left foot seventy to five times. Wow, yeah. that's impressive. Mm-hmm. You know it by heart. You're probably gonna do one of those podcasts minute by minutes. I'm uh, I'm gonna do it as a one man show. Oh wow. Mm-hmm. I'm excited for that. Yeah. But I, but I, to be clear, I'm going to be on my feet and pacing like a traditional one man show Mm -hmm. blocking, going to be pacing, going to be, uh, gesturing wildly with my arms, things like that. Yeah. You should do a, like a Spalding gray kind of approach. That'd be kind of cool too. just sit down and lecture to people the whole time. Tell stories. That would be yeah. good. I can see you pulling that off. Mm-hmm. And and also I will be monologues. doing, also it will, I will be doing a Mark Twain voice, but that's not really <laughs> good. <laughs> want to see that too. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of things up top. There will not be an April episode because I'm spending time working on the website for the Chicago Critics Film Festival, which starts May 3rd and runs through May 9th at the Music Box Theater in Chicago. 
Go to ChicagoCriticsFilmFestival.com for your week-long guest pass. Today, titles will be announced very soon. You'll see me and a bunch of nerdy critics and possibly Patrick out there for six days, or at least a few of those days. Um, very excited. It's a yearly tradition that uh, I'm glad it's continuing. It's mm-hmm. going to be a lot of fun. And I'm also going to be rewatching some movies for the upcoming birthday special featuring Bill this time. We've done two episodes covering 50 favorite movies, and well, like most things, why not make it a trilogy? I know you love trilogies, Patrick. Almost as much as I love just listing movies I like. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's great podcasting. There's going to be new things for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There will be things that I haven't talked about all the time. Mm -hmm. I've been seeing more experimental films. Mm. I now have a Plex server. Yeah, so you'll get that episode with Bill, which is fun. We love doing it. And then later in the month, Mitchell Beaupre is going to return for an episode about Jeremy Saulnier. Mm -hmm. That was their choice. And uh, I'm excited to watch all his movies, including Mm -hmm. the one that I know I watched and I know I loved, Hold the Dark. And I I don't remember a thing about it. It's good. Yeah, I want to see that again. It's better than Green Room. Hmm... Green Room's not very good. That's no, the thing. I think, people, so. I think it is very people, good. The thing about thing that people forget about Green Room is it makes no fucking sense, and there is no a point that either side has any leverage, and yet the entire movie is about them negotiating about whether or not they should open the door mm. when there's no reason for the people inside the room to open the door or to trust the people on the other side of the door. And therefore, it is totally dramatically inert. Huh. That is my hot green room I certainly felt tense watching it, but who knows? Maybe I'll watch it and go, hmm. If Assault on Precinct 13 was about the Uh, gang and the cops hanging out on either side of a door and going, maybe we should let you in, but maybe we shouldn't. And the gang being like, (laughs) we promise it'll be good. And they're like, but they're a gang. We can't trust them. Oh, okay. Like, that's that's what green room is. It's a very silly premise for a movie. Uh, We'll see. There's a brand new spanking 4K Blu-ray thing that's out. With a lot of extras, I'll probably watch it. That's the most mm. old man you've ever sounded. A brand new spanking 4K Blu-ray, Blu-ray thing. I know. I sound like uh, William Friedkin. He was, you always say, it's coming out on Blu-ray. <laughs> <laughs> Blu-ray. So, yes, you're going to get two episodes in May to make up for the lack of episodes in April. So, that's exciting. Mm-hmm. Without further ado, we're going to talk about the director of the episode. Yeah. yeah, when I make Personal Shopper, it's a movie about urban loneliness. Yeah. And, and longing and, uh, you know, and missing something. You know, she in this yeah. case, she misses her brother, but ultimately mm. she's missing something in the, in, in the way we yeah. all have this sense of missing yeah. something, of frustration. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we live in a society which doesn't give us answers. Yeah. And, and we, we, we are like left on our own with unanswered questions uh, about w- what we are doing why we are doing it how we are doing it and how the society we live in does function or should function or we should relate to it you know there's something that constantly remains unanswered there's this loss of a sense of community i wasn't as enamored with clouds of sils maria much i don't i think that was my very first olivia asias film i watched i know he had made a ton before and I felt like they were all titles. I'm like, I know I've, I should have seen these by now, but I didn't. And I, I love, I, I certainly really liked Clause of Souls Maria quite a bit, but maybe not to the same level that you did. Mm-hmm. And most of the, for the most part, I just thought like, this is a very talky filmmaker. And I still feel that way. And I wasn't getting a whole lot of stylistic flourish or any sort of like anything that made him remarkably distinctive. But at the same time, once I got to personal shopper, I kind of went, huh, this is, this is working on a level that I hadn't expected for me. Um, probably because mo- most movies about grief do to some extent. And then I started to get really curious because he was very highly regarded and still is highly regarded. And that's kind of when I made a mental note. I want to do a podcast on this director at some point because there's something going on here. I'm not exactly sure what it is. But that's just, that's exciting. That's a reason why to do this show. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wasn't like over the moon either about him. Going through all of his work, there were a lot of ups and downs, a lot of highs and lows, a yeah. lot of moments where I'm like enamored with him, and then moments where I'm like, hmm, I don't get what you're doing here, dude. So this is, I think, this is going to be a lot of Directors Club episodes are 
the host is the neophyte, and then we bring on an enthusiast or advocate who is like, let me tell you about Alain Rene or whatever. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? yeah. Um, and I think this is going to be a different episode because I don't believe either of us would think of Olivier SES as one of our favorite filmmakers. I personally don't think he's ever made a masterpiece. There's not a single film on in his filmography that I have no reservations about. I think a lot of them are good. And I really think almost all of them I've seen are interesting, except for one, which I'll get to. Um, and so, like, I, he's an interesting filmmaker. Um, and he'll, he'll one, we have... Uh, We'll have fun chewing over, but this is not necessarily going to be us telling you uh, about why he's so amazing or whatever. Yeah, I think uh, well, that makes it exciting too. I on think that I level. think one of his uh, big uh, fans is Mike D'Angelo, which is how I first heard of him. Is because uh, around the era before Clouds of Sils Maria came out, this is probably around the era when Carlos came out in like 2010, mm. is when I started reading Mike D'Angelo's reviews and going back and reading all of his old writing and stuff like that. And he is a big champion of Livy Assia. So I always had it in my mind like, oh yeah, Assias is one of those names that eventually I'll get to and I'll discover yeah, how Rose great and he is. Bomb, p- people like that were citing him a lot and um, saying he's, he's amazing. And when Clouds of Sils Maria came out, I was absolutely fucking you did call it a masterpiece it. yeah no I, I didn't and i thought that i thought that at the time i don't i don't believe that anymore but like i was i was floored by it and there are still parts of it that i think are absolutely phenomenal but um and so that was when i sort of went back and i watched some of the other ones and um but for the most part i didn't really have a sense of the shape of his career because he's a very yeah. eclectic filmmaker i would say if you've never seen an Asius movie a good way to a good comparison point in terms of like what his body of work is like would be someone like Soderbergh, mm-hmm. where there's a lot of movies that are very different from each other, but they all feel like he is attempting something um, that there there's a certain idea. There's uh, there is sort of like an intellectual curiosity that is producing this work. And part of the reason this movie feels different from this movie is is because he specifically is trying to seek out new ways of making films. He's not someone who sort of refined, slowly refined a style over his career. Yeah, I would agree with that. And listening to him talk in an interview, he, he basically said like he really tries to separate the writing process from the filmmaking process and that he tries to go into each film not knowing exactly what he wants in some ways mm-hmm. and make it more collaborative. So again, the whole organic approach, I think, works in his favor at some points but like even something like demon lover i feel like you know you you kind of lost the plot here um you know it's it's sometimes i think it's good to ma- map an outline of like you know like this is what i think this movie should ultimately be but i i mean he is really good at uh compartmentalizing the process from what i hear like he really sort of just doesn't think about how a movie's going to look or even camera shots while he's writing he's so focused on the writing part and interesting. I, yeah, I found that really interesting. I, I can totally see that. I, and I will say that another thing that might make this episode of Directors Club a little bit different from others is that uh, I did not do a lot of biographical research at all. Um, he wrote for Cahir du Cinema. I did yeah. not go back and read any of his essays. Uh, I haven't really read many major critical works appraising his mm-hmm. his films. Um, I didn't look up a lot of his biography. I know, you know, I know who he married and divorced and, you know, I know who his partners are and I know who his father is. Um, but, and then I know from, he has a, a vaguely, uh, somewhat autobiographical film, something in the air. And I, I got a feeling of what his, uh, teenage and college years are from that and cold water. But like, Oh yeah. Generally speaking, um, I'm sort of approaching his work from just like looking at the work, but hearing that that is his process, it does make sense to me. Um, I kind of feel like I want to recommend really quickly just the talk house podcast episode, because that's where I listened to him talk with uh, Kelly Reichardt. Excellent. And and that was, that was just where I learned about that and found it really interesting. Um, Processes are very different. He, uh, he doesn't, he strikes me as an intellectual first. Mm -hmm. He strikes me at like, like I said, he he, he started as a critic at Cahir du Cinema. He's very much a cinephile director. He's very much when making movies, he is building off of like film history and is inspired by all sorts of films. He's a huge fan of Michael Mann and he's a huge fan of uh, Fuyad or whoever Mm -hmm. who did Le Le Vampire uh, in 1919. And and Bresson. And Bresson. And uh, if you've seen Day for, uh, if you've seen Day for Night, then you're going to understand where Irma Vep comes from, uh, uh, maybe yeah. even more than the vampires. Uh, Day for Night is sort of where that comes from. Mm-hmm. And uh, so like he he's very 
intellectual in terms of how he thinks of the medium, but I don't think of him as like a natural born filmmaker where no. anything he sets his mind, he's like, I'm going to do this kind of scene. Uh, like he can do it great. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a division between him and Soderbergh. Cause like when it comes time for Soderbergh to do an oceans 11, he is going to make the most pleasurable, slickly made edited, yeah. like heist movie ever. Whereas Assyas, when he goes into genre, he is coming at it from an odd angle and he kind of eschews a lot of the typical dramatic pleasures that come from like a thriller. Mm -hmm. You know, like yeah. there's a there's a gunfight in Boarding Gate uh, and, bo and the gunfight is not like a really slick, cool, exciting gunfight. It's all about disorientation and it's all about the space and it's all about the idea of what a gunfight represents in that kind of movie rather than like and now here's the part where I'm going to deliver pleasure to the audience there's there's so, there's so, almost like an instinct in ICS where he's like he distrusts the desire to entertain yeah yeah i think you're right that seems that seems accurate to me like i think some of some of his forays into i mean i didn't watch boarding gate but like i don't i can't see him being like Soderbergh in that sense. Of, right well, I, like we're we'll, we're going to talk about demon lover in more detail demon lover yeah. seems to me to be like if someone sat down with the project of how do you make Videodrome for the 21st century, like <laughs> Demon Lover is a possible result of that. But the thing about Cronenberg is Cronenberg loves monster movies and special effects. And yeah. he might be like the most intellectual filmmaker you've ever heard talk. But like when it comes time for the gooey violence, he understands that what you want to do he is delivers. fill a fake head yeah. with gore and then shoot it with a shotgun. Cause that's scanners. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like right, right, right. when it comes time to actually like put in the pleasures of the genre, Cronenberg delivers there as well. Whereas Asias uh, always seems to like shy away from that. Yeah. I would, I mean, I don't know. He's kind of messy in that sense, and maybe that's where, like, my reservations to fully embrace him come through with something like Demon Lover. But then, in, in contrast, once we get to Carlos, I was just like, "Damn, he he really knows how to put together a tense scene." And we both watched the sh the shorter version. Apparently, like the longer version has that that whole um, hostage situation. The uh, OPEC. Oil. Yeah, the OPEC, all of the oil uh, ministers in OPEC are right. taken hostage by the uh, Carlos the Jackal, that, that's the all terrorist. Drawn, drawn out much longer. I, I would, time. I would definitely be I interested would. in seeing the longer version of Carlos as well. Yeah. Um, but let's we, get to the beginning. Let's get to the beginning. So he is the uh, he is a nepo baby of sorts. <laughs> now, to to be clear, uh, something I did not realize until I started writing down my notes this very morning. He is not the son of Jacques Demy, the director of Umbrellas of Cherbourg and Lola and Young Girls of Rockford. He is the son of Jacques Remy who is probably best known as the screenwriter of like the 1947 Rene Clement movie, uh, Clement movie, uh, the damned. Oh, so right. He, okay. I so he was the son of a industry screenwriter who was successful and had a lot of credits, but not like the son of one of the most important auteurs in film history. <laughs> um, and, uh, but he was the son of uh, screenwriter Jacques Remy. Uh, his start before he was making films, he was writing for Cahir du Cinema. He was a critic. Um, he did work with his father as his father was uh, getting older and his health was failing him. He ghost wrote some of his father's scripts for television. So I think those are some of his very first professional works were uncredited, sort of like making up for his father's gaps uh, mm -hmm. when his health was failing him. Um, and then he did move into making a few shorts. He made documentary shorts and experimental shorts and stuff in the 70s. But the first major professional project he ever had was co-writing the 1985 erotic thriller drama Rendezvous, which was Juliette Binoche's sort of breakthrough role when she was 18. Um, it's Andre Rendezvous. Andre Tachin, I think, or I don't know how you say this last name, but Andre, yes. the filmmaker Tachin. Yes. Um, Rendezvous is sort of lurks in the background of Clouds of Sils Maria when you talk about like uh, Juliet Binoche's character. Oh, I was, you know, 18. It was an entirely different thing or whatever. And you're the thing you're supposed to be thinking of. If you are a, you know, someone who knows the history of French film is rendezvous. Mm. That's the kind of touchstone you're looking at. It's, it's a piece of crap because it's that, and this is going to be a common thing. It looks like, it looks like an erotic thriller of some it's, kind. It is a, if, if it was thrilling, that would be awesome. But oh. unfortunately it is like, sort of an erotic thriller at the beginning and then it becomes a drama hmm. but it does that French thing that drove me fucking nuts and pops up in a fair number of Asias movies as well I think 
I think so many of these male French filmmakers are so shitty at writing women. I think so many of these movies are about like, well, men are violent and possessive and jealous and insecure and dishonest. But the thing is, women are just like these unknowable sex objects Mm. and they're entirely irrational and they fall in and out of love with you totally at random. Sometimes within a single scene, a a, a female character will fall in and out of love with the man. And and in the end, it's like, that's in that the tragic division between men and women. And you're like, what the fuck are you talking about? So all these fucking movies are a man sexually assaulting and harassing a woman for 40 minutes. And she keeps saying no. And he keeps looming over her and threatening her. And then finally, he's like, fine, fuck you. And he's like, she's like, no, don't leave. And then he gets hit Ugh. by a car. And then she goes, life is unbearable without him. And then that's the movie. And anyway, that's Rendezvous. But that's, <laughs> that's kind of also the vibe of Parts of Winter's Child. That's kind of the vibe of uh, late August, early September. I got so fucking sick of watching the romantic relationships of these movies. Winter's Child I caught up with. It was very interesting to see him be that dark and sinister. And I mean, to me, it was like, where's where's the humanity? Where's the humor? Where's... I don't know. There's no levity to that story. Yeah, it's well, really well, like French and <laughs> like really depressing. Yes. Uh, we'll, we'll get there real quick. Cause uh, I do want to say there's something before that though. Right. After rendezvous, uh, he uh, co-wrote a bunch of other movies, but yeah. his 1986 directorial debut was disorder, mm-hmm. which is sort of like this crime and punishment style kind of movie about this like up and coming band who they break into a music shop late at night to get some better equipment because they have a de- they have like a tryout for CBS and then the owner is there and they accidentally kill him Ooh. and but it's like crime and punishment in that they never get caught it's only uh, but the guilt of the action sort of tortures everything um not a particularly interesting movie again not a thriller it's hmm. uh it's um, a, and a lot of the characters and especially the way the women are written, same, same complaints, um, very arbitrary uh, romances and like a lot of dramatic stakes hinging on these very arbitrary romances and stuff. One thing I do think is really interesting is this is his very first feature film. And one of the things that's really, really good about it is and this is actually something he does share with Steven Soderbergh is he is extremely interested in process. He is extremely interested in how industries function. Yeah. All that's of the very nuts true. and bolts about how the music industry works and what it is like to be an up and coming band and what it is like to have to get on the train to London and like where mm-hmm. you are in the bill and like all of the finagling going on in the background with the A&R guys and like recording your demo. All of those details about the music industry are awesome in Disorder. Wow. And I might like that, actually. <laughs> throughout, his, throughout his movies, whether it's the publishing industry or the film industry or uh, internet porn or, like, international finance, he's really, really fascinated by the nuts and bolts of how these things function. Um, these, like, often creative but uh, not always uh, industries um, – and uh, I think like personal shopper even has a lot of that sort of stuff where it's like, yeah, what I is it like to be, you know, his interest in the personal assistant uh, mm-hmm. role that Kristen Stewart plays in personal shopper and Klaus and Maria. It's all driven by that intense detail. And it was right there in his first movie. So I thought that was cool about it. Winter's Child, you're talking about like how Ooh. cold it is and how it feels like inhuman. Yeah. I it felt like Bergman to me. <laughs> it's, it's very, it's very cold. All of the color has been sucked from the movie. Yeah. I think I tolerated, I, I kind of, I like Winter's Child. Um, I did too. I was surprised maybe just because it was so different tonally. I, I think, I think the relationships I find, I found like equally um, unrelatable into unpleasant in, in, and unpleasant the way that a lot of these that I've just complained about. But I think the whole movie feels so fatalistic yeah. that it's like the premise of the film is all of these people are trapped in their stupid fucking patterns mm-hmm. and they keep falling in and out of love with each other. And they, and like none of them are doing the fucking thing they need to do to like move on with their lives and grow. Exactly. And, yeah. and it's like this, it's just, it's just, everyone is kind of doomed to, to be in these like toxic, abusive relationships because they can't break out of it. And because of that fatalism, I kind of uh, was able to appreciate that all the relationships are bad because you don't necessarily need to hope that anyone gets together. Except for maybe the pregnant woman. Yeah. And then also the ending, I think, is a reference to Umbrellas of Cherbourg, which again meant something when I thought his father was Jacques to me. And then meant a little less (laughs) when I learned his father was Jacques for me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) But that final scene of like Mm -hmm. seeing his child, but not seeing his child, that whole thing. No, Um, but like, uh, yeah. 
Sabine, there's that one scene too where she breaks into her ex's apartment and just like you, you see them embracing and then suddenly she's like taking out the knife and I'm just like, oh my God. Yeah. And it's, yeah, he just holds for so long and a painful time. It's just, you don't know what, 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 what's going on with her at all. It really kept me on edge. Another thing I, I think is worth pointing out about Winter's Child, I think disorder is not particularly well directed. There's some interesting moments or whatever, but uh, it, I think Winter's Child, he really is making a pointed effort to make these really beautiful one shots mm-hmm. where the ca- the camera is constantly moving and the composition is constantly changing and the blocking is really important and like characters start in one side of the room and they end up somewhere else and what starts as a two shot becomes a close up but then the yeah. camera moves around the the camera work it's not like energetic but it's very elaborate and it's very like you would have to you have to have to imagine there's a ton of rehearsals going on. There's mm-hmm. a ton of like you have to hit that fucking mark, you know. And I think yeah. that is very distinct from his work Seems in the '90s. In that sense, where it's very staged. Yeah, and when we once we get to the '90s, you'll see that he completely tosses that aside. Oh, oh yeah, to 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 a degree that got to me because I I think like you I I kind of the shaky handheld stuff. If if it's too frantic and it's not really serving the film, I mean, I guess if you're doing that in a party sequence, maybe it makes sense to some degree, but it kind of got on my nerves. I, it did definitely got on my nerves as well, and I think there's certain material that is more or less suited to it. Yeah. And yeah. so when we get to the 90s, we'll talk about that. This is also a podcast where there's a bunch of movies that are just not accessible if you're in America. Mm-hmm. So we did not see Paris Awakens. We did not see A New Life. Uh, Paris Awakens from 1991. We did not see A New Life from 1993. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, that's, before that's, we, I think he mentioned on the podcast too, where it's like he he's decided that he wanted to not work with composers at all after New Life. I think I think it was John. I always get it mixed up between John Cage and Don, John Cale, <laughs> whichever whichever one was in Velvet Underground. It was probably John Cale. Okay, John Cale. Yeah, I always get those mixed up. Yeah, but yeah, um, yeah. He he just told stories like he just didn't have good experiences working with composers to where you'll notice throughout the rest of his films that he hardly has any score. And most of it is again, getting him confused, non-diegetic music, right? Yes. Yes. Needle. Uh, well, uh, diegetic, he, he, he does both. There's, there's plenty of diegetic yeah. music okay, in yeah, his there, movies, yeah, is, but, but needle drops yes. specifically. Mm-hmm. He, he compose he, the music in his films is really, really well, uh, curated selections of songs. Very I well. think, it's I one think of my favorite common, parts of his, uh, it's one of his strengths. One of uh, sure. almost every one of these movies, it cuts to credits and then some pop song plays, and it's the exact fucking perfect song to end the movie. Exactly. Uh, he he is definitely up there in the upper tiers with the uh, Sofia Coppola's and Quentin Tarantino's of the world, as mm-hmm. far as like check out my fucking awesome music taste. And you just got to yeah. throw your hands up and go, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I know. Now before we get to Cold Water, which is I think. Uh, Probably your fa- your favorite Olivia Assis movie. It's such it's so close between my n- number one and number two. It's like neck and neck. Make me a deal and make it straight. Oh, sign the seal. I think it's to love and to be at your end. I hope you don't know it goes. We've been around the long time. Start to try to fight you. Take the big time. I got this book from the library, Filmmakers on Filmmaking. It's from 1995. So this is a book that came oh, out okay. uh, the year after uh, Cold Water did. And it was a collaboration with the French magazine uh, Positif. And it was various filmmakers from around the world and world cinema. Um, and they were all relating films that were important to them or they were like talking about stories, filmmaking hmm. themselves. They got like. It's really impressive list of people where it's just like, do you want to read the Coen brothers write an essay about a bit actor who's in four of their movies? Do you want to read Edward Yang and Billy Wilder in the same book? They got everybody. Oh boy. So Olivia Assias, and again, this is the one piece of criticism I, I read by him. So it's one of those things where it's like he wrote for Cahir du Cinema for so many years. I'm sure I could have taken any one of those writings and like picked it, at, plucked it out and then said, oh yes, this is the Rosetta Stone for understanding his work. Um, but I do think it is telling that when asked to talk about any movie that's important to him, uh, he specifically wanted to write about the work of Andy Warhol. Oh, um, wow. uh, he sort of focuses it on Lonesome Cowboys, which was a film directed by Warhol in the late sixties. And it was written and produced by Paul Morrissey, but it's more generally about Warhol's film career 
hmm. and the arc of it. And there Which is a, I know very little about, and I'm yeah. still curious because I am getting more into an experimental film. Yeah, I love Paul Morrissey, mm. um, but I, I Andy Warhol's actual directed films, I've seen very little of it. Yeah, but I have a quote here from Olivier Assias that I think explains how you get to the photography style of Cold Water and uh, Irma Vep in late August, early September, mm-hmm. um, which is this. I shall try to say a few words about a work that possesses the quality I believe to be more important than any other. The ability to seize the moment in all its fragility, movement and absurdity, an absurdity which enriches it since once the moment has passed, the absurdity is immediately lost. This is the ability to create an eternal present, not fixed, but animated by constant movement. Damn. And (laughs) <laughs> so this is the idea, I mean, this is paraphrasing or whatever, but like my my interpretation of this is basically like the idea of what is happening on the film set or on location or wherever the, between the actors is a thing that is uh, ephemeral and can be gone and you have to capture it with the camera and you can kill it, I think, if you worry too much about like, for example, the blocking of uh, Winter's Child. Yeah, yeah. And like, uh, like elaborate camera movements and everything. And yeah, I do if there'd think there'd been a lot of cuts or something that would have killed it. And I do think something that was written, if not while he was making uh, Cold Water, then shortly after he was making Cold Water, uh, mm-hmm. as something that was written at that point in time, I think that kind of explains very specifically Cold Water. But yeah. like to an extent, Irma Vep and uh, early August or late August, early September as well. I would. I would agree with that, and just sort of capturing the ephem- ephemeral. I mean, certainly, Clouds of Sils Maria. Just the, the, I, the overlapping between reality and fantasy, mm-hmm. and certainly once they start rehearsing, where does the you know their interpersonal relationship end and begin versus what's in the play? Mm-hmm. He really does that a lot. Well, yeah, I mean, but the the interesting thing about Clouds of Sils Maria is, I think by the time he got to 2014, he felt confident enough to do that without like reverting to documentary style yeah. handheld photography. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, uh, I think it's a little more controlled. I think Carlos is the last movie that I saw that is shot like that. I don't know. I did not see summer hours, so I don't know if summer hours. No, that's poor. That's more refined. It's more restrained in terms of, yeah. Like making it about the people within the scene and not the camera. Right. Yeah. Right. So I, I do think he eventually came out of this, but, uh, uh, I want you to talk about cold water for a bit. I love everything about this movie. Yeah. Um, how it just starts. I love movies that just start that have like doesn't they don't announce themselves like this is the scene that it's opening, and the transition from like the brothers hearing their grandmother talk. I think yeah, she's telling uh, them the story about uh, World War II about right. when they're fleeing the Nazis. It, yeah, worth worth mentioning. Olivia Assias is Jewish, mm-hmm. um, so that is part of his background as well. And the, the two brothers going in and tuning into the radio to hear Roxy music, I was just like, oh, my God. This, is, I mean, I like I more or less did that with my dad. But, you know, it's like I, I, I understand where this character is coming from. Uh, it, it's just the overall vibe of this movie felt like that period of time in my life. It yes. felt like, you know, adolescents, teenagers, like rebelling, but not like in a way that's unrelatable you know like i mean i can understand where they're coming from i don't i never really got to the shoplifting point <laughs> in my in my youth but i understand i i did know shoplifters i i knew people like this i hung out with people like this we certainly had um uh, you know bonfires and things and you know it was just kind of like i love coming of age movies so much and this just felt like such a a, pr- a perfect example of how to do one right that is distinctive too. Like there are just things that in this, that I kind of went, Oh, I hadn't seen this done before. I mean, there's, there's certain coming of age films like, um, Roy Anderson's a Swedish love story that just kind of like feel, I feel it so much. I feel like this is, I'm time traveling, but also experiencing what these people are feeling. They feel so fully realized that I just get so absorbed in, in, in everything. And it's not even like story driven. It's more of just character driven and just, they're hanging out and you know, it's a total vibe movie, man. Yes. And in the right ways. And I think it started out as like a project for a French television series. I think, um, it, it was supposed to be like a, I don't know if they were all going to be shown together, but Claire Denis, Andre Tachin, uh, and Chantal Ackerman. They all had separate coming-of-age stories that were very autobiographical in nature. 
Uh, the one the, Chantal Ackerman's uh, portrait of a young girl at the end of the '60s is incredible, and it's like an hour long, and it's very much like this. So uh, I haven't seen the Claire Denis one, but I'm dying to see it. But I think they all sort of came together as collaborators and and said we're going to each tell our own stories, and I think they were all going to be shown uh, simultaneously or something on TV. But this became its own movie, basically. Like he just sort of thought it was going to be an hour long, and then it became a full feature. And it, and this is also where I think Olivia Essiès became an international name. Yeah, I don't think any of his previous work really uh, penetrated very far into North America or anything like that. But mm-hmm. I think this is sort of the movie that made him uh, an international art house star, which to some extent he still is. Right. Um. It uh, takes place in the 70s. Uh, so again, there's there's the feeling of autobiography, um, not just in the fact that it takes place closer to when he was a kid. Though I think these characters are younger than he would be because mm-hmm. he was, I think, college age um, at the time this movie takes place. Yeah. But... Um, that makes sense. Also, just like the way it is, all of these like glancing remembered details. Like it's not just that they're tuning into the radio and they hear Roxy music. It's that it's like the two kids fighting over the transistor radio because they are disagreeing about where in the apartment is the best place to yes, get reception. Get reception. Yeah, and yeah. you get the idea that it's like, if not a pirate radio station, this is like a radio station outside of Paris that like is very difficult to tune into. Mm-hmm. But it's like this is where they get the good music. Um, and like, there's a lot of really detailed uh, scenes that don't necessarily feel invented because it's like the story needed this to happen. They feel like they exist as their own self-contained moment. There's like, there's the whole subplot about him buying dynamite, and you're like, what oh, the yeah. fuck are you gonna That's do right. with that dynamite? And the answer is, I guess he's just gonna give it to his friend who wanted the dynamite. He was like a middleman, mm-hmm. and you never hear about the dynamite again. Yeah, but you get the idea. It's like, is this a part of like they're are they going to blow up like is this a terrorist thing is this you know obviously something in the air is about him uh his left wing actions as a student uh something in the air's original french title is after may and it's sort of about like what do you hmm. uh may 68 is the uh big point in time where there was sort of nationwide protests and strikes right. and yeah, demonstrations yeah. all throughout uh france and so, like, Something in the Air is a movie that's like, what do you do once the energy of everyone agreeing on this thing ends? And, like, how do you bring that uh, politics forward or whatever? So, at any rate, you, you're wondering about these characters. You're like, are they, it's, is this going to be part of a demonstration? Mm-hmm. Is this going to be part of, a uh, like, uh, some sort of terrorist action? What's going on? Um, and... The, again, the camera work is so disorienting. Yeah. But very specifically in the way that you feel disoriented as a teenager, where it's just like very nervy, a lot of energy. It's people running in and out of focus. The scene where him and his girlfriend are like running through this department store and the camera's oh. like struggling to keep up with them. And there's just so like good. racks of clothes going through the foreground and you lose mm-hmm. them for a while. And it's like you you don't even get a sense of like the weird path they're walking through the store because it's such a close up on their faces. Um, this would be his style through most of the nineties is this like close up of faces. Uh, I would assume like a long lens camera because the backgrounds are always very blurred and moving very quickly, uh, as the, as the camera tracks the subjects. Um, but, uh, this is like perfect material for that style Mm -hmm. because it is just about like, what the fuck do I do? What the fuck do I do? Yeah, there's I have a, like a frantic energy. There's I have so <laughs> much energy and I'm so hormonal and mm-hmm. everything is the highest possible stakes to me. Yeah. Um, even even if there is the uh, like the, the premise of the movie um, broadly, which there's it's it's a little bit shaggy uh, here and there. But basically, the plot is that this young man is in love with this very troubled young girl. Um, and he wants to like support her and take care of her as she's going through drama with her parents who are divorced and, you know, are having a custody battle over her and he is like failing in school, but he comes from like a much more privileged, uh, bourgeois background. Something that appears in so many of these fucking yeah. movies is very funny is there is a scene where the, the bourgeois, uh, young, uh, male character gets lectured by his father in the study that happens in disorder. It happens in winter's child. It happens in cold water. It happens in something in the air a little bit. Um, Hmm. there was one other one that really surprised me where I'm like, God, we're we're even here too. But, uh, the comes from his life, I would think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like, I think there is throughout these movies, one of the running through lines that you can feel is this like, 
uh, sense of inadequacy uh, of, in these main characters and this sense of like um, uh, potential lost or what do you do with potential? How do you seize the moment? I mean, uh, if something in the air is about like, what do you do after, you know, May 1968, like cold water is about the very moment where you realize that like being a kid is done. You yeah. are no longer a fucking child anymore. I know. And that's, I mean, again, you just use the word like rebellion and you think of like, oh, rebel without a cause or to some extent pump up the volume. And I guess those types of movies are the ones that really hit me first mm-hmm. at a specific time in my life. But like even just some choices, like there's, um, there's like a cut where, I think she's hanging out in the hardware store where this display is about to topple over and then bam, you cut right to the school. It's like so instant and it just feels like, I don't think he, he gets that. I mean, no, I, I wouldn't say he gets very experimental later on in his filmography, especially once we get to Irma Vep. But I, I don't know. There's just like choices throughout, including, you know, once we get to the bonfire, I mean, there's just like the, the needle drop is from CCR. It's I, just like I kind of clapped. I was like, that's why I love movies. She gets <laughs> she gets caught shoplifting and her father takes custody of her and basically hospitalizes her in a mental hospital. Yeah. She escapes and there's sort of an elliptical edit where we don't find out what she does after she escapes, but she ends up at this party right. that, that he also happens to be going to. And it's this sort of abandoned house. I don't know if it's like one of the kids there summer house or something like that. That was my assumption. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've like done a bonfire. And it's and a just... house where I believe he even said that's where he hung out with his friends. Yeah. Okay. So it might just be abandoned, abandoned. Yeah, I think uh, so. By, by the end, the, the fucking house is abandoned because they're fucking breaking all the windows and setting the furniture on fire. But same house at the, at the end of uh, summer hours. So you have all of this like mounting, you know, tension in terms of like he what's what's going to happen with him in school? What's going to happen with him in the fucking dynamite? What's going to mm-hmm. happen with him and her? What's going to happen with her and her parents? And then the movie just kind of like. Uh, I don't want to say flatlines because it's the most interesting part of the movie, but the but the plot just drops away for 25 yeah. minutes and like basically nothing happens at this party. But you, the vibes you were talking about, Ugh. it is so much just like that feeling of looking around and being like, who are these fucking people? Yeah. And like, what are they doing? And and you, you like hear in the background, like people putting on songs on the record and then like stopping a record mid song yep. and putting on a new song. And like all of the needle drops are absolutely fucking perfectly curated the yeah the the ccr is up around up up around the bend up around the bend yeah and the guy smashes the window right when the song starts and i'm just like oh my god this is adolescence this is it right here but also like her cutting her hair and just walking around with the scissors too at some point i mean Mm -hmm. that's and then the other girls corning her and being like just give us the scissors and then she lashes at it and becomes this big dramatic fight or it's just like yeah that's a fucking high school party (laughs) oh absolutely it is yeah no i mean it's just that's that whole sequence is probably the highlight of his entire filmography for me i just got really excited watching that yeah yeah and it's and yeah and uh the, the specifically with up around the bend it's that like really crazy uh riff at the beginning that plays and then when it gets to the solo of the song mm-hmm. you hear the needle get scratched and then they start it again yeah. and it's that perfect thing where it's like i mean i still do this because i this is how i listen to music is by like hyper focusing on individual songs but like doing that thing where you really really love the first 90 seconds of the song <laughs> but the guitar solo is meaningless so you just keep skipping back yeah. to the first that song so you can hear the first 90 seconds mm-hmm. again that's so fucking adolescent uh and just perfect um, so for me, the, the issue with the movie is it is all sensation and all energy and all like really perfectly capturing that feeling of being this disoriented teenager. You're thinking it's going to build up to some sort of catharsis and it really doesn't. I, I don't even necessarily need catharsis, but the problem is the last 25 minutes of the movie all of that shrinks down because it is about the realization it's the it's it's what happens after the graduate when yeah. they stop laughing <laughs> like that's kind yeah. of what the last 25 minutes of this movie is but the thing is that's the point where i realize oh i actually don't know who these people are mm-hmm. i don't know who the characters are sure they're they're they get I good feel that performances way a lot of his movies i'm yeah. like i'm not sure if i understand his characterization isn't so strong you know i mean they're relatable I understand these people. I've known these people in the past, but I I actually couldn't tell you, you know, they don't really experience an arc. And I don't know if I necessarily need that in this type of movie. Yeah, either. But I think uh, there's a lot of empty space at the end of cold water where you are sort of invited to 
wonder what he is thinking and mm-hmm. it's like what are his regrets right now what are his concerns but i don't know him well enough to do that yeah. and i don't know how well he knows her enough you know what i mean right and so right. the ending of the movie it should be this like really heart-stopping traumatic uh tragic thing um and instead, I'm sort of just like, oh, man, I want to pick up the needle and move back to the <laughs> beginning of Up Around the Bend because that's where the movie was good. It does end kind of like a whimper. Yeah, which is which, again, part of the project is about like that is life is. Yeah, you have that shot of like the early morning. Uh, you know, you had the bright orange of the fire and people dancing in front of it and running around in circles and gleefully breaking mm-hmm. windows and throwing furniture into it. And then the next there's like a like a four minute one take shot where of the next morning where you just sort of see the people wandering around. Yeah, it is and the, that, it's the morning after it's the morning it's, it's, after it's and everything's all gray and everyone's hung yeah. over and like just gross. And like, that's what the movie is doing broadly. It's just, I think it is so much better at the first part than the second part. I would agree with that. I mean, I, I kind of was expecting to be emotionally walloped or something, but it wasn't, but I also kind of like, accepted it because I loved everything else. So yeah, yeah. No, no, it's, I, it is a strong recommendation from me. Oh, yeah. I mean, I can't... I, like, it would be uh, one of those... I mean, it's so funny that I had the, I had this random memory uh, of us being at Barnes & Noble, and we, were, we knew that there was, like, the Criterion Collection was on sale, and I was debating because I was like, oh, we, I really love... You know, personal shopper, Clouds of Sils Maria, and I see that Cold Water had just come out, and I was like looking at it, and I and I picked it up, and I go, I wonder if this is worth buying, and I couldn't decide, and some random person by us said, Oh yeah, you want you you'll definitely want to get that. Do you remember that happening? I don't remember. That. <laughs> it was just like weird. I I thought of that, and I was just like, Oh, I could have watched this much sooner in my life. That would have been interesting. But yeah, even just a complete random uh, shopper at Barnes and Noble gave this a really strong recommendation, but I had no uh, you know, like concept of what this even was. And I think that the element of surprise really carried it for me too, because I didn't know what it, what even it was about, you mm-hmm. know? So I think in the end, this turned out to be a movie that primed me for like, maybe I'm going to be a huge fan of this director. And it's okay that it, that didn't happen. It doesn't always have to happen. No, of course not. But yeah, I don't have to love licorice pizza. I realized. Yeah, you took, don't. Took some time in therapy, but I finally come to that conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> How often do you talk about movies with your therapist? <laughs> um, here and there. But yeah. Not, not. No, it's. It's not the primary thing. <laughs> no, it's is you not. working out? Why don't I like Godard enough? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> could be. Maybe down the road that's could that could happen. But I no, had a so I had good. a psychiatrist who asked me what I'm into and I said, Oh, I like movies or whatever. And this is like I'm nineteen at this point. And she goes, Oh, uh, have you seen many Rainer Verder Fastbender movies? And I went, No. And then she sort of like looked at me as if I was like she, she was like disappointed like she she made a face really? like really I thought you were into movies you're she, 19 <laughs> I know I know it was so she was fucking wild but anyway that's my association with uh with uh doctors and movies is mm. being fucking shamed by the t- playboy bunny tank top wearing psychiatrist who, who oh, didn't weird. think I was cool enough because I wasn't as into German new wave as her <laughs> <laughs> no um, but I'm, I'm totally all about like the, the, the low key naturalism, mm-hmm. this, you know, the sort of just h- hanging out, feeling like a fly on the wall kind of a thing. I, I just, it's, it's totally my jam. Like when I'm watching this, I'm like, this is, this is, this is what I love. And I'm glad that it's here. I'm glad that we were able to highlight it and I hope people check it out. It's on the Criterion channel, mm-hmm. but just buy it. <laughs> I'm going to buy it next Criterion sale for sure. Oh, you didn't take that guy's advice that day. No, I didn't. <laughs> I don't think we. Bought, I don't think I bought anything that day. I was just yeah. like in, too indecisive. It really is. We talk about that a lot. Just decision paralysis. Criterion Collection time when it's on sale. I'm just like, I just want them all. Vous avez lu l'histoire de Jesse James. Comment il vécu? Comment il est mort? Ça vous a plu, hein? Vous en demandez encore. Eh bien, écoutez l'histoire de Bonnie and Clyde. Irma Vep from 1996. What an interesting movie. It's one of those where I'm like watching, I'm like, 
because yeah, I know you're more conflicted I'm on more, this than I, me. I should like I should like totally vibe with this one too. I don't know. It's it's a weird. It's once again a lot of handheld camera work. Once again, that it's about disorientation. Mm -hmm. It's about m the manic energy and the confusion of the characters, like Cold Water. Yeah, it was it was written very quickly, and it feels like it. Again, it's mm -hmm. it sort of has that you know. Um, Again, I just don't want to like say, oh, it's very energized and stylized, but it's more of, I thought it was, I was expecting something more than, again, like expectations made me think like, oh, this is going to be like a really transcendent Hollywood satire or something. And it just felt like things that I've seen before. Uh, I mean, to some degree, like his next couple of movies are very punk rock and just like, I'm going to go for it and see what happens and sort of let the film become whatever it is. But um I just, I, it's one of those things where investment is a huge part of why I love movies and I don't get as invested in these characters for the next couple of movies. Um, it's, it's more just like a curiosity for me watching this. I'm kind of like, this is interesting, but I mean, I certainly love Maggie Chung who doesn't, she's incredible. Uh, and just like, she looks stunning throughout this entire movie and it's a really interesting performance and her, uh, just Feel the, the sense of dislocation and displacement in this world and like getting interviewed by that journalist who's just like so harping on, on American film and all that stuff and making her feel really uncomfortable. Uh, I feel like I've seen, I, I can't even like specifically pinpoint like, oh, I thought of this movie while watching this, but it didn't feel fresh or exciting to me in the way that I expected. I, I feel like one, a good way to approach Irma Vep is to think of it as something along the lines of a Barton Fink or a Schizopolis, where okay. it's like, yeah, it is an that. expression of frustration mm -hmm. and an expression of, I don't know what I'm fucking doing. And yeah. like, I, and like, the, I'm going to push through that apprehension and I'm going to push through um, my self doubt by just like going weird or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think that it is a an expression of frustration with the film industry. It's yes, an for sure. frustration of the future of film, a future of film, but also very specifically centered on France's place in film. And like France is not what it once was. I don't like I am not an expert on French cinema in the 80s and 90s. But one of the reasons I'm not an expert on French cinema in the 80s and 90s is because France was not really a hot world cinema at that time. Yeah. Hong Kong was ascendant at the time. There were, you know, uh, American independent films were ascendant at the time. But like there was, I think, in the industry. And again, there's there's a certain level of ignorance I'm bringing to this. And to a certain extent, like I, I talk about, like, I think Olivia Assias is an intellectual filmmaker and I think he approaches uh, movies in a very from an intellectual place and that's mm -hmm. sort of his starting point and like I'm not an intellectual I have not read uh, Guy Debord uh, you know good on you <laughs> if you can finish the fucking society of spectacle or whatever I can't do it so like there's always going to be elements of, of these films especially really idea driven films like this that I'm just like not able to grasp yeah. and also I just don't know the, th the history of the French film industry well enough to point to individual parts of it and say like obviously this is this this is mm -hmm. Whatever. But I do think there is this feeling in Irma Vep of like the new wave was so fucking long ago. Yeah. And like, what do we have now? What are we really doing? And I it feels I like a movie in search of itself. And I think it's funny that it comes on the heels of his breakthrough movie, Cold Water, because I think there I think it maybe also a, a way of viewing it would be like the anxiety of the sophomore slump, hmm. even though that's, you know, it's not his second movie. Uh, there is an anticipation to what Olivia Assias is doing after Cold Water that maybe didn't exist after Disorder. Oh, sure. Um, and uh, so I, I think all of that is interesting. I think Irma Vep individual scenes, I agree, are things that you have seen before. I think the yeah, the clueless director or just like the, that guy who's like she's supposed to be <laughs> she's supposed to be mute in this scene, right? Right? Like, and he's like. Oh, I know, but I still had to give her direction anyway. <laughs> um, there is, uh, it, well, I mean, like... The, Little comedy moments like that, I just kind of went, yeah, okay. Well, there's, a, I mean, obviously there is a legacy of the just hysterical weirdness that is film production. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, like, Man with a Movie Camera and The Cameraman. So even, like, in the silent era, people were making movies about how ridiculous movie making was. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's Singing in the Rain. There's, like, movies about making movies are just abundant. I think uh, a big touchstone here would be, again, uh, Francois Truffaut's Day for Night, um, which is, I think, 
a more accessible and uh, comedic uh, Francois Truffaut movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a movie that came out around the same time as uh, Irma Vett, a little bit after. Isn't the guy who plays the director from Day for Night? Uh, yeah, Jean-Pierre Lyot, yeah, who is right. uh, Antoine Daniel in, mm-hmm. um, in 400 Blows and its sequels. He plays the sort of temperamental, uh, self imp- self-important, um, uh, horny actor in Day for Night, and he plays the uh, sort of lost in the weeds uh, director. Yes, um, in uh, Irma Vep. So there's that legacy as well. Um, you know, State and Maine came out a little bit after this, and State <laughs> and Maine I think is like the super polished, every line is hysterical like version of this kind of movie. Exactly. Yeah. The thing that makes Irma Vep special, I think, is not necessarily any the way any individual scene is approached, but the overall shape of it. Um, and the context of it being about Maggie Chung getting to a movie after it has already started. So once again, we have that in media res thing where mm-hmm. she was on a project in Hong Kong that went a week late. So she gets there three days after and they're like rushing her through everything. And she's not there at the end of the movie because she gets fired from it. So we don't even see <laughs> the movie when it's done. Right. We that only have. bothers me, but I mean. I love the way it ends. That's uh, for sure because it's just something completely out of left field and Brocky, Brockian, or how you ever want to say it, Brockage, Stan Brackage, Stan Brackage, Brackian. There's say. a lot of there's a lot of avant-garde filmmakers who uh, you know uh, manipulated the actual celluloid and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know did, the guy who did Outer Space. Obviously, there was there was one film. There were the Chicago Film Society did a 16 millimeter celebration a couple months ago. And I forget the name of uh, the director who did one that it specifically reminded me of. Mm. But at any rate, I feel like the ending of this movie is sort of Olivia Assias throwing up his hands and saying, like, no, no, we just have to fucking tear it all down. Yeah. Like, like whatever, whatever structures we have built to produce film have now gotten too big and they do not produce art. They produce commerce. And like, I, I want art. I'm very serious about making art, not commerce. I'm mm-hmm. very... Again, my instincts are never to entertain. My instincts are never to get big box office. My instincts are always to approach something from a weird angle that interests me personally. Yeah. And I want to tear everything fucking down. So I think the shape of the movie in terms of you don't see the completed product. You don't see how it starts. You have no idea what they're even planning on doing once they recast Maggie Chung yeah. and they see what he's edited. Like, I think all of that is really a very awesome way to express specifically what it would feel like to be Maggie Chung in a place where, you know, you don't speak the first language and everyone's talking about you and around you. There's a lot of othering that goes on. There's a lot of exoticizing that goes on. There's a lot of very casual Orient Orientalism and racism that goes on around her. Um, but in a believable way, not in a, like this is Olivia Essius ax to grind way. It just like, I think all of the, uh, performances and dialogue are very realistic in that way. Um, but also, in general, film production, the way you get from uh, a script to something that you sit down and watch in a movie theater is fucking insane. And ha- <laughs> and compared to almost every other medium that exists other than video games, which are not necessarily on his mind in 96, but like uh, other than video games, I think like there's no medium that it seems more counterintuitive. Mm-hmm. Um where like if you've ever watched like a really extended making of documentary and like this is one of the reasons what it is at the beginning is rarely what it'll ultimately be in the end or Or just like in your head any individual day the tasks you are trying to complete it is like it takes so much work to remind yourself why those things are important for the final product yeah because like you're fucking obsessed with getting the gun to be go right and you forget like the point of the scene in the first place because everything he comes out getting that fucking gun to go off right i could see myself being very frustrated making a film like and this. everyone <laughs> and everyone is just like so tired because it's this fucking marathon of art production if you are an author and you're writing a novel you write a paragraph and then you read the paragraph and when you read that paragraph you are doing the same thing that the reader is going to do at that paragraph yeah. when you are making a film there's no fucking way of telling what the fuck you're doing at any given moment and you get so out in the weeds and that's like what paul you know john well, maybe that's Pierre what he's Leon's trying to capture in this movie and that, I, yeah. yeah and i guess i can see that i don't know if i found it entertaining or as interesting as i expected it to be maybe because of the hype of like oh this is a real insane treatise on the filmmaking process and i was like it yeah but i also i don't know like i guess 
the 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 blurring of fantasy and reality happens here. The mm-hmm. the tension between real and imagined, and her becoming the character that she's playing, that sort of thing. I feel like, yeah, he kind of that's he he will definitely go back to that to some degree in a yes. more engaging way for me later on. But that's not to dismiss this either. It's just a little bit of a disconnect for me. Sure. I and I I think there's other stuff going on. Like I think that at a certain point there's like a nine minute stretch of the movie where it becomes a silent film where you're right, either right. watching them shoot the film silently mm-hmm. or you are watching them watch the dailies and the dailies yeah. look bad so no one's fucking commenting <laughs> and it's like an awkward silence but like I like the idea that the movie itself starts to go back to 1919 to remake Le Vampire which is the, the plot yeah, of the yeah, movie no, is cool. Maggie Chung gets hired to play the character of Irma Vep that Musadora played in the original French serial uh, Le Vampire um so, like, I like that you get those callbacks to, uh, you know, uh, Truffaut with uh, Day for Night. You get those callbacks to the silent era. You get the sense of the uh, disorientation of French cinema in a increasingly, uh, you know, and it's, and it's decreasing relevance in the, you know, world cinema. I think you get a lot of personal anxieties, like... I think the reason we watched like two whole minutes of the heroic trio is because (laughs) there is something in Olivier SES that does not want to entertain the audience. But I think when you look at what the original French serial of Le Vampire is, it's a pot boiler. It's a serial. It's Mm -hmm. like get to the next thing. Big cliffhanger. It's constant invention. It's like the reality of like who the vampires, the gang are and like all of their little devices and gadgets and schemes and stuff. It constantly surprises you. And it's all about like entertaining you with its invention. And I think there is something in Olivier SES that feels guilty that he can't be Johnny Toe. I think there's something in him that feels guilty that he can't be Fouillard or or Mm -hmm. however you pronounce the director of Le Vampire. And I think there is a self-conscious anxiety. I think when he is casting Jean-Pierre Liode as a version of himself. I think that, and when he makes him the most incoherent, like lost in the weeds, like zonked out fucking director in the world. Like I, uh, I think that he is doing something that is autocritical. Um, yeah. Okay. And I, I There's find a real push and pull. I find that, that, and, and also it's just a movie where you can never predict what's going to happen next. Yeah. And I think that that is awesome. Um, I think that it's once in retrospect, once you've seen it once and you realize that the last shot of Maggie Chung that exists in the movie is her in the cab waving goodbye to the makeup lady. And that's like, that's her waving goodbye <laughs> to being in the fucking movie. Sure. I think that's really funny. It's one of those when I, when it was over, I think if I go back and watch it again, I'll get something out of it more now that I know what I'm in for. Exactly. Yeah. I think that'll happen. If you, if you go into it and I, I but again, like, like cold water, uh, she waves goodbye. And I love that there's still 25 minutes left in the movie and a long scene of the new director who gets hired recasting Maggie Chung's part. Like that's not an interesting scene Mm. and it doesn't really, it's not, it doesn't add very much to the movie. And as much as I like the, the expression of frustration and the feeling of like, let's just fucking tear down cinema. Let's, we have to start from first principles again because the way we're making movies now is insane. Um, that, that like very avant garde sort of, uh, aggressive chopped up it's it's basically john pierre Leod's character attacking his own movie yeah and that's, it's 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 almost him giving it's the um it's su- such a cool thing to do yeah <laughs> i don't know like, and then I all get the, that rebellious punk rock feeling and and that and, the, and that goes down to the handwritten credits that in my mind it's olivier assayas's handwriting it's yeah, certainly messy that would in make that sense way to me. sure the, the way that when inglorious bastards start you just know that that's quentin tarantino's handwriting because why would he hire someone to write like that <laughs> <laughs> that has to be his own so like i mean that. i love the use of luna and certainly no sonic you didn't do the score but one of their songs is in this mm-hmm. and i i mean like again great needle drops. Oh yeah. The, he directs what, the hell out of a party scene. Yeah. I mean, as we've seen. So, um, I love that there, I and love she goes out in the rain in that one point. Oh, it's so good. I, th- I think the, the digressive nature of itself is expressive of the medium mm. and the industry. And like, I think it's one of those things where once you start examining each part of it and how it is constructed, it's, it's like a fractal where everything is expressive of the larger thing. Okay. Um, more than it is like, a final end all be all. This is what film is kind of statement. Right. Yeah. And, but I, but it is just like less interesting once Maggie Chung leaves and it is a messy movie where 
the part of the mess is that like I get I get bored during that uh, one party where the uh, two women are talking about Maggie Chung for like just forever. It seems <laughs> like, um, yeah. So I, I think it's really cool and I really like it. And I especially I might as well talk about the TV series now. The TV series. I'm very curious about this. It because sucks. I'm, it's really bad. Some people think it's. Yeah, yeah. Some Look, people think it's, it's TV. Yeah. People always will elevate it. Yeah, elevate it. And you're wearing a fucking A24 hat. There's people who will always elevate an A24 thing, which it is. It's trash. Uh, I'm the not going to elevate Vep, Love Lies Bleeding the way most people are. <laughs> uh, Irma Vep, the HBO miniseries, the eight episode uh, series that mm-hmm. exists as a semi sequel to the original Irma Vep because. It is. It's revealed later on that the director, uh, who is basically the Jean Pierre Liod character, has already remade it once before in the '90s, and then you see clips of Irma Vep <laughs> with Maggie Chung, and it's like it's his like backstory is that he was married here. to the movie star because he did marry Maggie Chung shortly after they finished Irma Vep. That's right. And they had a yeah. three-year marriage that ended badly, and a lot of the movie or a lot of the series is about him openly like talking about what went wrong with his marriage, and it's very like I'm divorced, whatever. Hmm. It is mm. the way I would sum up why Irma Vep doesn't work. Number one, no energy compared to it is super traditionally shot. It is very much like any generic fucking TV show you've ever seen. Guess what? Here's another. It doesn't have the energy of a Carlos. Uh, oh, I didn't wow. see the Wasp Network, which is the TV series he did in 2019. That is sort of seems similar was, to I Carlos. It was just a movie. I don't know if it was a TV. Was it? I believe the Wasp Network is a series. Huh. Um, I can double check, but uh, but like. It's one I just everybody dismissed entirely, so I just never thought it was essential to watch. I think, and I think something we're going to talk about with personal shopper and Closet Sills Maria, and the reason I don't think of Closet Sills Maria anymore is I think he is he's a fluent English speaker. I think he's much worse at directing actors in English, and I think uh, his yeah. dialogue. I think there, whenever and characters are speaking English, all of a sudden the performances get worse in a way that makes me think. As fluent as he is, he just is not nuanced, nuanced enough to get what he needs from actors when they're speaking a language that's his second language. With the exception of Kristen Stewart, I would say. Well, let me tell you something about the Irma Vep TV series. Kristen Stewart is in it. <gasps> she's a, she's talked oh. about as like uh, the main star's uh, ex-boyfriend's current girl, uh, current wife, who is this pop star. And they sort of talk, oh, yeah, she's off touring or whatever. And there's a whole subplot about her having a miscarriage and all that. Huh. And when she appears in the final episode, you're like, oh, that's Krista Stewart. That's the pop star. And it's like great casting because it's like yeah. she's the most famous person in the movie or the series. And she's the most famous actor. And you have watched seven and a half hours up to this point of mostly bad acting. I'd say the best way to describe the Irma Vep TV series is late period Woody Allen, where it's like. You know, it seems like he doesn't really have his finger on the pulse anymore, and you're getting, uh, uh, what's her name, an irrational man talking about how she wants to go smoke some grass, and you're like, this is 2014, no one says grass. <laughs> Parker Parker Posey has some really cringeworthy lines in Irrational Man. And, the, and that late period Woody Allen, you used to be the person who knew how people talked, but now you don't understand how people talk. And so most of Irma Vet, the series, is people just like bluntly stating, things in the film industry are so different now. Especially if you watch it back to back with ni- uh, with the 96 film. Like he, all of the dialogue is fucking picture, picture per- perfect or pitch perfect. Um, the TV series, the dialogue's horrible. It's mostly people just like going, Oh, yeah. Well, the thing about art is it's hard to capture art, but is it art or commerce? Can it be both? I don't know. It's like it's the most boring fucking shit you've ever seen. And that's the whole fucking show, except also he seems intent on actually remaking Lee Vampire. So a huge portion of of the series is just clips from the original serial. Hmm. And then you see the clips of how they shot it. And it looks like so I, sometimes I have I struggle like. Do filmmakers, when you make the film within the film, when you make the TV show within the film, the work within the work, (laughs) did you do a bad job because you weren't as invested in the film within the film as you were the actual film? Hmm. Or do you have contempt for the art? Like, Clouds of Sales Maria, they go and they watch that superhero movie. Yeah. It looks like a fucking giant piece of trash. It does. And the question is, did it doesn't look like a giant piece of trash because uh, he has contempt 
for the thing he's portraying because it's not exactly satirical that clip in clouds of sales maria it's not like you want it's not like the clips at, it's not like the end of the player right mm-hmm. at right, the end right, of the right, player right. you're like robert altman has contempt for this project but he also has the satirical wit to dial into what is contemptible about it exactly in Clouds of Sales Maria, the clip from the superhero movie is just, it just is trash. It yeah. just looks bad. And so when you watch clips from the Vampires remake that they're doing in the TV series of Irma Vep, you have to ask yourself, well, the series around the make about the making of this also looks like trash. So does he <laughs> think he's making a, this is what good prestige television looks like? Or is this supposed to be trash because he has contempt for what they're doing? It's hard to tell. It's a, it's a very bad series. Um, I'm almost getting exhausted by the meta thing. Like just like too much of that. I mean, too much commentary on just like, well, let's talk about the filmmaking industry within the film and then make it a TV series. And then maybe it'll become a podcast. I don't know. It's just like, come on. Well, that's, the, that's the thing about tell like tell Irma story. Vep, the 1996 film. That's so great is mm-hmm. it's like, it's more contained for one thing. It's it's 96 minutes yeah. and it constantly hits ev- all of these tired talking points from weird angles. Hmm. Whereas most of the HBO series, which people say is good and they are incorrect, it is fucking trash. Most of the HBO series is people sitting down in luxury hotels bluntly talking about art with each other. Oh, that would get annoying. Um, and then there are like interesting subplots that never get picked up again. And it's one of those things where it's like when it's in a 96 weirdly shaped object, like uh, a 96 minute weirdly shaped object like Irma Vep, that's one thing. But when you have eight hours and you like set up a subplot that doesn't get paid off, then it's just boring. Right. Um, because because you're just like, well, I wish we would have learned more about how her personal assistant becomes a director, but I guess we had to watch you remake 15 scenes from Le Vampire for no reason. Hmm. It's a bad, it's a bad TV series, but it is, uh, it is like I finished, uh, I watched Irma Vep, uh, like about a month ago. I started going through Olivia Asias's filmography, roughly chronological order. Uh, went back, watched the HBO series. And then immediately after finishing the series, went back and watched, uh, the 96 film. And then it was like, Oh, it is this so is what, clear to me works. now. Yeah. This is why this is like all the energy, all the life, mm-hmm. the weird shape, all the things that make that such a special movie were way clear. So it is at least a good illustration of uh, what makes the film special by being the opposite. And I can't imagine Alicia Vikander as the lead in that being anywhere near as compelling of a, uh, you know, just a character as Maggie Chung. You're did. right. It's They're not trying the same thing. Yeah. Alicia Vikander. I would, I would tell. Yeah. Uh, Alicia Vikander is specifically being Kristen Stewart, where she's like, okay. I... I am someone who's, I mean, they use Marvel movies because it's mm-hmm. 2022, um, but like Kristen Stewart in Clouds of Sales Maria and Personal Shopper was coming off of the Twilight movies. And that, and she was in a place where like she was a huge star and she, but she wanted, her and Olivia Assias had a very good symbiotic uh, thing for a bit where like oh, he yeah. suddenly got his work seen by a whole lot more people and she got uh, the auteurist credibility of, him. Yeah, she won awards, like major awards. And she's and clouds. she's fucking great in those in those yeah. movies and stuff like that. And so the Alicia Vikander character is more that, where she's coming off these superhero movies and she's sort of rediscovering her love of art rather hmm. than just the um all of the uh the trappings of being a rich and famous movie star. Interesting. And yeah, it's almost like the Chloe Grace Moretz character from Clouds of Sils Maria. Exactly. Play. Yeah, interesting. So it's a bad it's a bad TV series, and I don't recommend watching it. There's a couple of movies in between I did not see uh, before we get to one that ooh, works. <laughs> right. So late August, early September is shot the exact same way as Coldwater and Irma Vep, but it is in fact an extremely complicated relationship drama about okay. four people who you all you hate all of them and you don't know why any of them like each other. Mm-hmm. But it's so disorientingly shot that you can't even like really place what is happening and. And so why it's handheld the whole time? Or? It's it's Ugh. a lot of handheld. It's a lot of his when he doesn't know what to do in terms of blocking. What he'll do is he'll have a character start walking clockwise around a room, and then the camera will follow them. And I want to say like two thirds of of late August, early September is close ups of people's faces as they walk <laughs> clockwise around a room. It is also a movie that people say is very good, so I don't want to like dismiss it completely. This is the only Olivia Assis movie I've seen that is not interesting. Okay. So it's boring as fuck. Uh, we did not see Le Destiny. 
Um, it's like the, three hours long. The I only mean, thing of note I will say about Le Destiny is it's the only feature he's made that he was not the sole writer of. Okay. But I don't know anything about it. Let's get to, that's from 2000. Let's get to 2002's Demon Lover. Oh, no. Uh, I don't think, none of us, neither (laughs) of us are going to sit here and tell you that Demon Lover is a masterpiece, but we do disagree on the movie, and I do want to hear (laughs) why Jim is bellowing. So, Jim, oh, why don't no, you tell no, the folks, no, fine no, folks no. about Demon I mean, Lover. not my jam at all. Uh, it's a very difficult film. It has potential. As I'm watching, I'm like, you're getting somewhere. I just don't see the quality. Uh, in even, in, like, Ebert's review was like, by the end of the movie, I just didn't care. And I agree. I just, I felt it just like, Irma Vep, at least, I felt moments of being really engaged and really into it. Uh it's just like certain moments. I've just felt a distance. Like I felt a distance the whole way through for this movie. I thought, um, Connie Nielsen was just a total cipher that I just couldn't find. I couldn't understand where she was coming from. Most of the time, she's just sort of like wandering. I didn't understand her, like just her intention of like what she's trying to accomplish in this world. Um, I just I found myself feeling like this is kind of a muddled movie. Like I don't know what, like something that kind of revels in unpleasantness. As we've go, we can go all the way back to Rob Zombie for that. Yeah, that I just can't find my way in necessarily. To like, I mean, I understand. Like, okay, you're commenting on where the internet was going at the time and the dangers of technology and the fears. And, you know, we can certainly point to something like the dark web as kind of like a, a, a really seedy, horrible place that you just don't want to even dive into because you know how horrible it is. And there's these like underground chat rooms where you can actually create a scenario of torture on a real human being in a very snuff film kind of fashion that I just, I mean, I don't know. I kind of found it like so painfully dated and silly like these just, the, I mean, again, we're going back to this era when this was first happening. So, of course, it's going to look dated. But, I mean, I almost, like, laughed. And I it's supposed to be horrific. It's supposed to be, like, really shocking and jarring. And the um, the anime sequence with, the like, the, the, te- the tentacles and stuff. And I don't know. I just, I didn't understand precisely what this movie was trying to do. And by the end, I just kind of shrugged it off. I mean, it's... A treatise on like the dangers of the internet just doesn't really hold a whole lot of like emotional weight throughout, and I don't think that's the intention at all. Is like create like an like an engaging story. It's more of just vibes. But again, the vibes didn't work for me this time. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying it's D. Snyder's Strange Land or something. You know, like that's kind of like that movie was like reveling in horrible exploitive thoughts of you know hiring people for. You know, it's like to get tortured on camera so people can watch it at home on on their computers or whatever. But this is just something that I can't get behind in any way. But I'm sure there's more to it that I'm just not picking up on. Do you like uh, the sort of late period Michael Mann thrillers like uh, Black Hat and Miami Vice and all mm-mm, those? Mm-mm. But I'm going to do a Michael Mann episode in July to see where I hit where I come down on that. So I it's been a long time since I revisited those movies. I have not seen Miami Vice since it hit DVD. I hated it at the time. I hate it. Um, <laughs> I have I have come around on uh, I I do like Black Hat and I do like to a certain extent Public Enemies. Um, and I have come around on the approach of those films. I, I don't think any of them are masterpieces. The I'm not digital look. Yeah, I like the look of them. I like the. I mean, I think I. I ask because, number one, Olivia Assias is absolutely a huge Michael Mann fan. And number two, Demon Lover and Boarding Gate are a sort of twins of each other. Um, in And Boarding Gate very specifically feels like it, it came out like the it. year. It came out the year after Miami Vice. And it really feels like someone sat down and said, 
I'm going to make a fucking Michael Mann movie. And I'm guessing Asia Argento in that movie is also a cipher, cold and kind of distant and not really. So, so the thing about, uh, I, so Demon Lover is less a Michael Mann movie in terms of character and more, again, like I think Videodrome is, is sort of the touchdown yes, there. Yes. And I think like if you look at the work of David Cronenberg, you are going to see a lot of characters who are very cold and emotionless and they are ciphers. Um, Crash. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Crash is that. Uh, Scanners is certainly that. Mm-hmm. I think the uh, the the ex husband in uh, the Brood is one of the most boring protagonists you'll ever see in a movie. Yeah. Um, uh, you certainly, you know, William S. Burroughs is a fascinating character, but it, there's not a lot of emotion going on in Peter Weller's performance. This is a movie about a character who everyone is constantly talking about how cold and inhuman she is. Yes, exactly. So like, it's it's not like, oh yeah, Connie Nielsen just didn't. Is it Connie Nielsen? Yeah. Is that is that the character? Uh, Connie Francis is the singer from the '60s. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Connie Nielsen. Connie Nielsen in <laughs> Demon Lover. It's not like oh yeah, she just gave a bad performance. She may have also given a bad performance, but what she has been asked to do is to personify the um, sort of dehumanized, dehumanizing nature of yeah. international finance and the way you get broken down into. Uh, uh, you know, into your desires. And I think the world this takes place in and the general, just nervy, weird, like willingness to rub your face in it, energy of it. I think those two things work together well enough that I can vibe with this movie. Even if by the end, it literally just fucking punts the ball and goes, guess what? It doesn't matter if this makes sense or not. Um, yeah, that's what I didn't like about it. <laughs> I, watched, I watched this one twice, and the, knowing where everything goes the second time, it did not make the last 25 minutes make sense. Yeah. Um, also, this movie is very reactionary, and the things Olivier Assies lumps together in terms of what he finds troubling about modern culture is like hentai, but also new metal music videos, but also Chloe Grace, uh, not Chloe Grace Moretz, Chloe Sevigny playing Oni for the PlayStation 2, which <laughs> is just like an action game where you karate kick people. Mm-hmm. Like all of these get roughly lumped together in a way that's bizarre. So I think he doesn't quite have his finger on the pulse, but I do think the idea of the most out there, fucked up, ultra uh, taboo desires you've ever had are actually bought and sold and owned by major financial corporations. Okay. Is like a really Hellfire fucking club. fascinating <laughs> premise. The, I, the very dry boardroom meeting about the different porn sites they own Mm -hmm. and the very dry talk about like the legal ramifications of buying this company that produces hentai and like the, the way it breaks down the, like you see the clip of the hentai and there's like, it's full blown tentacle porn. It's a giant orgy. You watch like four minutes of hentai in this movie. That's too much, man. I I don't know. I don't know. I don't know your experience with hentai, Jim. Mm. Not, I, I'm not very familiar. I have seen. I've at least seen Legend of the Overfiend uh, on 35 millimeter, which was a very exciting uh, huh. time for me. Not a fan of of hentai, but I was familiar enough from watching Legend of the Overfiend of the vibe of it, of the violent sexuality, of the uh, you know surrealist, uh, gross out body horror that accompanies sex in it. So like the idea that you are like sit down and watch this like just four straight minutes of really fucked up hentai and then like all of that gets reduced down to like corporate espionage and uh, really blank rooms and really cold characters and like steel and glass and like just, I think uh, it revels in that too much though. I don't know. It's like, I know he's making a commentary about it, but just have like revels in what too j- much. It's j- just the, the unpleasantness of just the, the hentai stuff, but it's just one scene. Yeah. It feels like it's more <laughs> <laughs> to me. It felt like, Oh, it's happening a lot, but probably not. I'm just remembering it that way. But ooh. yeah, there, it, it, I, I, when I watched it the second time, I was like, Oh, that's right. There's only, this is a, this is a scene about espionage and corporate sabotage in the high, in the high stakes world of 3d hentai, which is <laughs> you know, in its own fucking hysterical that, that that movie exists, that he got this made. Yeah. Um, but like it only, it, for it being about that, there is only the one scene where you see any of okay. it or anything like that. And I think I think it needs to exist because it needs to linger in your mind the way it has lingered in your mind as something that is shocking so that when he, at least when he attempts, I'm not saying this is a very successful movie, but like when he attempts to break that down into like the things you desire 
are not your own desires. They are, in fact, commodities. And everything uh, is a commodity. And in the yeah. world of international finance, all of humanity uh, has been broken down into things that are bought and sold. And allegiances are bought and sold. People switch sides in this movie in weird, like, arbitrary ways. You don't mm-hmm. know who's on whose side at any given point. And it is... Yeah, that kind of bothers me, too. I don't know why. It's just like... I mean, if you're looking to this to be like, I want to see a thrilling thriller, Olivia Assius is never going to be that guy for you because he does not want to entertain you. But I think Black Hat is a similar film about, like, part of what I like about Black Hat is that I'm so fucking disoriented as I watch it that it gives me the feeling of the ominous... Uh, like three dimensional dread that is like the world mm. of uh, globalization and international finance and all of these things that it's like and like crumbling infrastructure. Um, it's not I a can movie see that appeal. It's, it's not like a huge scale movie. It's like if someone made the world's least engaging James Bond movie, where instead of like windsurfing into an army base where he shoots a million machine guns, it's the same plot structure as a James Bond movie. But instead, it's just like all these like really gritty, gnarly, disorienting personal scenes. Hmm. There's things about Black Hat that I think are really fucking cool. And maybe if I saw the director's cut, I would join the people who call it a masterpiece or whatever, which that's not me. But like. The thing I love about Demon Lover is uh, Olivia Assias got to a lot of that in 2002. And I do think looking at internet porn and saying like, this is, this says something for, I think being alarmist and saying like, and now fucking school kids are going to watch snuff as they do their yeah, math homework. Cause like, so, like that uh, shit is so fucking corny. And I love that that American, uh, fucking suburban kid who's watching the snuff at the very end of the movie has a Godzilla remake on his po- <laughs> uh, Godzilla remake poster on his wall. Yeah. Like these are things that Olivier Assias finds equally contemptible murder for f- murder for profit. And also the fact that Roland Emmerich made Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, yeah, like yeah, he paints with way too broad of a brush. And at a certain point, like it just is dysfunctional as a thriller because mm-hmm. you don't know what the fuck is happening. Also, that bothers me the premise that anyone on this entire planet could ever give a fuck about Connie Nielsen and whether or not she fucks that one bald French guy. Yeah, who cares? and like who whether cares? or not they have a relationship. Yeah, who cares? I know. Also, there's like a long date scene towards the end of this movie that is just the worst part of the film because impossible to imagine anyone caring about mm. that shit. So I'm not saying this is a masterpiece. I am saying Olivia Assias, with the exception of late August, early September has only made movies. I find interesting. And I yeah. find this movie very interesting. I mean, it takes big swings, but I'm not here for it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, yeah, it, it could just be like a, well, if you know, this is a movie that's not for Jim, that's all there's, that's all there is to it. And that's right. not a bad thing. And if people do connect with it or do find interesting things about it, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm, uh, that's partially also why I love doing this show is because I love or listening to podcasts is because sometimes I want to know what somebody else finds interesting about it, even if I don't. Right. But, and I do think Demon Lover is an intellectual exercise that is, like, he talked about how he was inspired by Guy Debord. Like, I, I already referenced this, but, oh, like, yeah, Guy, yeah. Guy Debord and the uh, Society of Spectacle. Like, I there's there's probably layers of Demon Lover that I that even me who is somewhat defending it here like I just I have cannot access and that's fine and that's to a certain extent uh, my inability to fully touch all of his work might be coming from the fact that he is operating from a uh, r- sphere of influence that goes outside of my knowledge but mm-hmm. I do think Demon Lover is really cool I do think if you were like. There's things about Demon Lover that are cool, but what if it was just a cool, like, fucking thriller? Um, I think Boarding Gate is awesome. Oh. So I would recommend it's on Tubi. But you so said it's free I probably wouldn't like it. That's you probably wouldn't like it. Um, That's my guess. Yeah, it's. I watched the trailer and I'm like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> It is, it is shot like you don't like Light Perry and Michael Mann, so you don't you will not like Boarding Gate, which is yeah. which is doing a version of it, but not. Without I will say I, I do want to say though the the score for Demon Lover is great. I really like Sonic Youth's score. I think he also cla- or they collaborated with Jim O'Rourke on it, so I th- I'm all for that. That was a good score. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't. It's interesting. I don't like uh, I don't like Sonic Youth. And I, I, you oh, know, you agree with Juno? Then they're just noise. <laughs> <laughs> I, I that's, that's what Juno says. In the movie Juno? Yes. I didn't know who you were talking about. (laughs) 
I was just like <laughs> racking my brain. Like, who do we know that's named fucking Juno? Because I did not remember that quote from that movie. Um, I had a nightmare uh, a couple weeks ago that I went to a party and Thurston Moore and Kim Gordon were there Whoa. and they were being really mean and shitty to me. And I was crying and, oh, I, no. and I specifically was saying, why would anyone choose to be cruel? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that nightmare came from me dwelling on the fact that uh, the fact that Sonic Youth makes no sense to me uh, makes okay. me feel uncool, mm. um, especially when, uh, you know, Olivia Asias clearly thinks he they're the coolest. Um, but uh, no, I mean, Dinosaur Jr. is my ver- my I go. What if what if someone did Sonic Youth, but they wrote good songs instead of not writing songs at all? And then I say that's Dinosaur Jr. Mm. So that's even that, Daydream Nation. You should give Daydream. I've Nation. listened to that song. Okay. It's fine. Okay. But like I've listened to three Sonic Youth albums and Daydream Nation is the one that has, I guess, Bull in the Heather is the oh, only yeah, other really song that yeah. I could like tell you a melody from. Right, right. Um, whereas Dinosaur Jr. write fucking great riffs and also are like over the top, yeah, crazy, melodic, crunchy, noisy yeah, and stuff like that. Yeah, they know what they're doing. Yeah, they're great. They're better. Any, they're better than Sonic Youth. I'll give you that. Any, at any rate, so, uh, what's Boarding Gate? I'll talk about Boarding Gate. A Boarding bit. Gate is Asia Argento is, uh, basically the, she is not a sex worker in the traditional sense, but she, her boyfriend basically pimped her out to businessmen, to global businessmen, as a way of securing deals in mm. his world in the in the in the realm of international finance. And they have a very toxic, sadomasochistic relationship. In general, across the board, Olivier Assayas's sexuality is sadomasochistic, and sadomasochistic sex appears again and again um, throughout his work. Which there's nothing wrong with it, but when you uh, couple that with like some of the creepy vibes you get from him and like, you know, like, Oh yeah, he made a movie, uh, with Mia Hansen love when she was 17 and they got together three years later when she was 20 hmm. at only immediately, only immediately after him and Maggie Chung got a divorce. Probably they didn't do anything before. It's like, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not accusing Olivia Assias as anything, but like just seeing the women he writes, I go, all right, maybe I don't trust you in relationships. So whatever sadomasochistic sex totally a okay and some of the scenes between her and michael madsen who plays her like abusive boyfriend are really hot and interesting mm. um eventually she gets pissed kills him she has to go on the run she uses her ties in the world of of international finance and the underworld and stuff like that to go on the run in hong kong kim gordon appears as a cr- <laughs> she's a, cr- a cantonese speaking <laughs> crime boss which is fucking great um, the ending is kind of a whatever, like it's kind of like Demon Lover that by the last 15 minutes, you don't know what the fuck happens, but it is a more stripped down, more thriller oriented version of that kind of Demon Lover, international finance, dis- disorientation, uh, you know, individual being smashed by the thing is like, this is, this is all the stuff that Michael Mann was doing with Thief. Um, but yeah. the thing about Thief is it is a, you know, it is a Marxist uh, screed against, uh, you know, capitalism, but it is also just like a fucking awesome movie. Right. Uh, Olivier Assayas does not have those chops. So I'm not telling you that Boarding Gate is a fucking awesome movie, but if you are the person who goes yes to Miami Vice and yes to Black Hat and you haven't seen Boarding Gate, you really fucking should because it's very fascinating that the year after Miami Vice came out, Olivier Assayas said, me too. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if I'll feel. I'm not recommending it, it to you, Jim. But we uh, we have listeners, and when we talk, we're not just talking to each other. We're talking oh, that's to very an true. audience. That's very true. You're right. I forgot about them. Um, Hi, people. Thank you for listening. By the way, uh, a genre exercise. Yes, that's uh, that's always fun. I'd like to see directors try. Now you'll have to tell <laughs> me about his next film because I did not see Summer oh, Hours. Wow. Well, it's about grief. You see, I'm just a happy little cloud. I laugh and the float and the sing my song But the other clouds don't like me none They say I am behaving very wrong You see a cloud's supposed to be sad To cry and weep and tear his hair and all It don't matter how hard I try I can't get the first little tear to fall Or float with me to this There is very little plot It... it, it. To some degree, this is where I thought of like, I don't necessarily think of him greatly influenced by Romare, but this to me felt like his Romare film in a way where it's just, sure. 
very talky, very hangout and, you know, people trying to connect with their emotions, even though they've been, you know, damaged in some capacity by, you know, losing a, you know, a, a key figure that kept them together. The, 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 the mother grandmother in this film is very, you know, starts out very strong where we'd sort of learn about her and see at her relationships with everybody within the family. And then like 15, 20 minutes later, she's gone. And there's not like a big production. There's not like even a huge funeral scene. It's so more, it's, to me, it's like the like the whole film sort of just becomes about impermanence and the fact that people you love may not just be there the next day and that's it. Like it wasn't like a big production. It's kind of dr- lacking drama, which kind of surprised me in some capacity just because I'm like, I'm expecting that. I'm expecting like a big outburst from one of the, you know, the brothers or the sisters or something, but it's, it's very restrained and reserved in that sense. And yet like it, it's sort of, is about time and how elliptical and fluid it is. And some people will live a long life. Some people won't. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, there's like also just a, a, a real interesting emphasis on when you're in mourning, your brain decides to suddenly sh- shift towards something pragmatic and practical. Like what are we going to do with the estate? What are we going to do with, all the stuff within her estate. What are we going to do with the paintings? How are we going to appraise the paintings? Like just use your brain just immediately says no more emotion stuff because it feels too heavy. Yeah. That you just got to focus on something else. And that's what I really liked about the movie. I really responded to it. But I think again, my expectations were a movie about, you know, a family member dies and the, how family members deal with it differently. You're expecting catharsis. You're expecting somebody to have a big scene of some kind or like a big dramatic revelation. And you don't get that. And again, I'm not saying that's bad or it wasn't something that like turned me off that we don't have a big somebody breaking down scene or something. Uh, It just kind of, you know, it, it flowed and it sort of becomes something else a little bit by the end that reminded me of uh, cold water where the party scene, a party scene happens where the estate is and a par- you know a, a key person from the story just says my grandmother passed away and you're expecting her to cry you're expecting something but it's almost just like that just happened it's something that happens and i feel like you and you and Sharon sort of have an interesting uh, reaction to when I get really emotional when a celebrity passes, mm-hmm. in that you're just like, mm, it happens. Mm-hmm. And plus, you didn't know that person personally enough to really have a strong dramatic response. Whereas I always feel like oh, I'm kind of sad that this person passed, even if I didn't know them personally. I think this film sort of caters to more your and you and Sharon's approach to mm-hmm. death. It's just like, yeah, okay, moving on. <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying that that approach is bad either. It's just that I get emotional about people dying because the person in my life that was cl- I was closest to died. And so every time somebody dies, I think in my mind, I kind of process it differently than people who don't experience really close personal loss that way. I th- so I think that f- this film captures that like sort of, mm, okay, let's move on. Yeah. We got other things to think about. Uh, death just happens. Yeah. That's what summer hours is. Really. I feel like I'm that way because I, uh, I am, I like, I, I feel like a lot of my personality, honestly, is me sort of assuming the worst is going to happen at all times and trying to protect myself from it. So never hoping for anything good. And when something bad happens, it only confirms my suspicions sure. and yeah. that protects me from being hurt or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, I think like if, if, it could if, be a if the mechanism. general dynamic between me and you is that I am more cynical and I am less likely to be disappointed and like these sorts of things, like, I think like I'm I'm that way in part as a way of protecting myself. Yeah. As, no, that makes complete sense too. Um, yeah. And I think people in this movie do that. I think that's yeah. that's let's think about something else other than this horrible thing that yeah. just happened. I thought that I have not yeah, I didn't see Summer Hours, but I think that is a really fascinating thing to build a, a I think movie you should around. see it. I'd be curious to hear what you think of it. I certainly really like it a lot. I don't know if I've gotten to like feeling love for it either because I almost it almost it was interesting to watch in the midst of all these movies because I'm like 
it does feel like a summation of all the other things that he's done in other films and other ways and in interesting ways. I mean, certainly Juliette Binoche is here, but I just think like her character is kind of relegated to more in the background than I expected. And it is more of like an ensemble piece that more or less works. It's just, again, maybe I'm, I want to feel more when I'm watching a story about a family grieving and I didn't, but at the same time, that's okay too. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. I don't have to cry at every movie. Right. I think in general, one should approach Olivia Astia's movies with, okay, what do you have? Not mm-hmm. like, oh, you're making this sort of thing. I yeah. hope you give me this. Yes, that's how I approach it. <laughs> <laughs> that's and, and that's that's my own shortcoming to some degree with with certain movies. Like even the the like I I go back to this all the time where it's just like I, I expected something more from Licorice Pizza and I didn't get it, but I don't think that's bad either. Yeah, you know, and I, that that can happen. That just you know, sometimes you can't control <laughs> what your expectations are, right. and then when they're not met, you're like, hmm. Why, why, why didn't I get what I want? Again, I mean, this is, again, this is part of my cynicism is I don't, I don't allow myself to build expectations. And I think that is like, That's probably part good. Of why, like there is nothing about demon lover that instantly goes, yes, this is the kind of movie I want to see. Most of it on a pure formal level, I find kind of repellent and ugly. Mm-hmm. Um, but mm-hmm. it's only, but I, I find that repellent ugliness interesting when I'm considering the whole thing. And the only reason I can consider the whole thing is because I did, and I did know its reputation going in. So like I was also my, I had expectations as well, but my expectations were, this is going to be thorny and difficult. So I just sort of sat down and said, okay, what do you have for me? Um, but show me what you got because Olivier SES is going to hit all these genres, but he is not concerned with, I'm going to make an excellent version of this genre of film. He is going to say, I'm going to approach this from an angle that I find personally intellectually stimulating to me. Mm-hmm. It's it's always good to sit down and not say like deliver a perfect coming of age movie. It's instead good to sit down and be like, what do you think a coming of age movie is? And yeah, and Summer Hours is probably he lost his mother. Yeah, and this is his. Yeah. Idea, this is what he how he approached it, which is refreshing too because again. How many movies are sentimental and saccharine and have mm-hmm. a big breakdown scene, you know, and like some, a big revelation from one of the family members like, oh, this painting meant so much to me. And like, oh, God, well, now we got to sell it. Or there really isn't that. It's more, again, very low key than I expected. And again, I'm using that word expected too much because <laughs> really that is me to some degree. Like I kind of think some, it's going to be something. And then when it isn't, there's a, a little bit of disappointment. Yeah, but I'm also now. That's probably why I rewatch movies a lot because then I go, oh, now I know what to, what I'm in for. You can, like, I can just you feel you can yeah, more properly I watch can, it a second time. Yes. So yes. that 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 recurring phrase of I have to rewatch it is really like I need to see it uh, for the first time with my expectations shattered. Yes. Or whatever. I mean, on the other hand, you know, one of the best feelings in cinema history hmm. is when you sit down to go hundreds of beavers. This is a movie. Ah. This is going to be like a fun slapstick kind of a thing. And then it is the greatest version of that thing that you were expecting. No kidding. That's such a good feeling. Like when you sit down and you want. I want that movie to be out now so I can. It is coming to back to the music box. I think only for a single screening in April. But. Oh, God. But if you have if you get a chance to see hundreds of beavers, uh, (laughs) this is my this is I'll cut into the Olivia Asias to talk about a very different movie. Hundreds of beavers is. Uh, I'd be shocked if I saw a movie I liked more in 2024, but I've been surprised before. Uh, fucking adore it. The funniest movie of the past, however many years, just like adore it, adore it, adore it. Best video game movie, not based on a video game ever. <laughs> yeah. It is, it's so fucking video game, but mm-hmm. like in only the best ways and hundreds of beavers. Anyway, that was, I was thinking about that in terms of like, have I ever sat down with expectations and was glad I had expectations? And I think, if I, I think, I think hundreds of beavers, when you are excited about something and it turns out to be better than what you were expecting, oh, yeah, that's, that's a, a very a, good feeling. I know. It's wonderful. It's funny. We were talking about, oh yeah, well, Olivia says he's never going to do that. He's always going to subvert your expectations. Let's talk about like probably the most like main, not mainstream necessarily. Cause politically it's very not mainstream for 2010. Oh no. Um, but like. Yeah, a movie that, or uh, at least a series that got uh, edited down to a movie that is just like, this is the kind of thing it is, and I'm going to deliver that. 
maybe the only time in his career. I don't know. I didn't see nonfiction. It, it, yeah, but like, no, it is. It, it really is. Like, Carlos I, is a political thriller, and you watch it, and you go, yes, that actually is a political thriller. Yeah. Now, the way it ends, the way it winds down, the way it tells his story, I do think is interesting and subversive in some key ways. I love how it just ends. It's so like... Okay, we're in French airspace. Done. <laughs> like that's it. Um, well, I, I was about to. I say mean, maybe the, maybe it's. Longer. I was going to say the opposite, which is like it has this very extended coda after all of the oh, that's action true. ends. Right. He uh, he gets like what what kind of disease does he get? I forget now. He gets some sort of like stomach issue or. Well, I, I'm talking more generally about like so. Um, Carlos is a movie about Carlos the Jackal, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Illich Ramirez Sanchez, played by Edgar Ramirez. Phenomenal. Who this. was um, a Ar- Argentinian? Ar- he's South American. I can't recall the country he's from, but he was a left-wing terrorist in Venezuela- the 70s. I think it's Venezuelan. Venezuelan, that's correct. Thank you very much. Yeah. So he was a uh, Venezuelan uh, terrorist who fought for the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine throughout the 70s did a lot of bombings, assassinations, targeted actions for decades and decades. He attained a sort of rock star status um, as an international terrorist. Uh, Fascinating movie. Like, I think probably it would be much easier to get this movie made now. But in 2010, the idea of a like pro-Palestinian terrorist, like killing, uh, uh, killing uh, key Israeli figures. um, And like, but like specifically, this isn't a uh, a uh, John Frankenheimer movie where it's like, and it's about the men who try to track him down. It's like, no, no, no. This guy is fucking hot. He is a rock star. We are going to play New Order, and you are going to look at his gorgeous naked body dripping with water because he is the coolest guy of the 70s. And why? Because he's, he wants a free Palestine. Again, probably uh-huh. an easier sell in 2024. Yeah, but in 2010, so. I, I think that in itself is a subversive thing i think this movie in some ways is a fascinating uh counterpoint to munich which munich itself i thought of munich i thought of like soderbergh and munich like, watching this and in, in the right ways munich i have not seen che so i can't necessarily compare and contrast it with che but yeah. like munich itself was considered controversial for the more right-wing uh parts mm. like israel i did i do think came out against it but if you watch munich you can watch munich and it is about like Oh, what is justice? What, you know, it's about the struggle for, you know, overreaction. It's about like, what are we even doing and why? And can we go too far? And it's about America's war on terror. And it's like, yes, 9-11 was a horrible thing. But does that give us uh, allowance to become horrible people in seeking retribution for it? They, they, all of these things are, exist in that movie. But you can watch Munich and 100% not understand that Israel is an apartheid state and that the Palestinian and like you can have no idea why the Palestinian terrorists uh, killed the Olympic team in Munich in the first place. Right. It's not a movie that delves into the political realities of the world that created the situation. Um, I'm not familiar with a lot of those political realities, to be honest. Well, you are now. You are yeah, well, yeah, about the apartheid now. state. Definitely now. Like the formation yeah. of Israel was. I'm, I'm not getting a, into yeah, all that you shit. Don't, but, you don't need to. But I am. I, 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 but I will say like. Munich is a movie that if you are pro Israel, you can still watch it and probably be comfortable Mm -hmm. because you can say their aim and their cause was good. But and and I think making a complicated thing about people who are ultimately in the right is what he attempts to do. And the funny thing that contrasts this. Uh, with uh, with Munich with Carlos is like the thing Spielberg's actually really good at is fucking cool ass thriller assassination scenes oh, and yeah. it's kind of why Munich doesn't entirely work is because it's much more about how fucking what a cool may, fucking yeah, thriller it, it is it cool, makes it De Palma like and just like oh wow yeah. <laughs> some of the fucking camera work in Munich is absolutely oh, insane <laughs> uh, Carlos on the flip side is very firmly like it is about um, him as a sellout it is about the it is also about like our aim is just mm-hmm. a free Palestine is a just cause, but can you go too far to free Palestine? So it's like coming, yeah. it's like the same approach from the opposite angle. It's like, who are you going to align yourself when you start taking missions from these, uh, you know, countries? It's like, it turns out a lot of those countries are legitimately anti-Semitic, Even if you aren't, there's like an interesting character in Carlos who is this, uh, East German, um, communist 
who is uh, uh, who's fighting for the left. But when he learns that his fellow German compatriots are anti-Semitic, it freaks him out because he hates fucking Nazis more than anyone right. because he's German and he's like never fucking again. And he he completely quits his life uh, in, you know, f- uh, fighting for the left when he discovers this because he just gets um, so dispirited by that information. And so, like, it is it is not a movie purely about like assassinations and bombings are 100% cool and acceptable and awesome, but it is no, about like, you see the consequences, this guy being a rock star. And when he is about to get caught by the French police at that party scene. Yeah. You oh, you are oh. on his side. That's yeah, no, awesome. Are. You I know. I got, I got so un, like unnerved by what was happening. Like, Oh God, he's what's going to happen in this scene. And that's so, the scene where you're like, well, okay, well, Olivia, yes, yes. You did a, you did a thriller scene. Congratulations. You did. You, you did didn't like do a weird elliptical edit where it cuts the tension or whatever. No. You just built tension and then paid and, it off. And then we all had a good time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the entire storming of OPEC, in yeah. in Vienna, that whole sequence is really powerful and really like intense, and it, it, like it, just when they start storming the hallway and mm-hmm. stuff, it, it really like I thought, man, you really brought your A game to this story. I will say, I think that scene is awesome. I also think that there's specifically the gunfight in the hallway sucks. I think he staged it poorly. Mm-hmm. And it's like, there is a scene where it is like seven German cops with machine guns, all firing on two people who are 15 feet away. And <laughs> one of them gets grazed and you just go, all right, well you don't have it. You know, there comes a point in time where it's like, like I, I already talked, said this about Soderbergh. When it comes time for Soderbergh to make the heist movie, true. he That's can true. do the weird subversive, not quite a heist movie. That's oceans 12. But like, <laughs> When it comes to Ocean's Eleven, like he's going to make a fucking cool ass heist movie because it's important to him that that part mm-hmm. is done well. And I just I don't think Olivier Assayas has those chops. I think the party scene where he's about to get found by the French police and how he gets out of it. I think that's cool as hell. He does a fucking little Django thing where he shoots four people in the head immediately. Right. Right. <laughs> um, but like, I think I think the action scenes in movies like Boarding Gate or Carlos kind of show they're why. Sloppy. What's that? You think they're sloppy? I do think they're sloppy. I do think yeah. he just can't uh do these things correctly i feel like i feel i feel like same tension you i i I, you can go back to irma vep and the sequence where you are watching three minutes of the heroic trio and you are watching johnny toe one of the greatest fuckers to ever do it (laughs) do it really fucking well i do think that is olivia assias going like this is the kind of entertainment i can't make Mm. this is like i have so inadequate watching hong kong films because even though like you know, his taste in Asian films is he's going to make a documentary about how she Shen. It's a little bit <laughs> different. Um, but like, I do think there's an inadequacy there. And I think when you get to 2010, when he actually attempts it uh, in, and luckily he kind of hides it. There's not a lot of like, most of the action in this is all about like feeling like you're there and documentary realism. It's not about like staging cool action scenes, but when he does get to that one hallway shootout, I go, all right, I'm calling bullshit. You didn't do it. Well, ah. um, but really cool movie. Very cool movie. I mean, it's interesting how he just, he grounds Carlos in a way, like, there's scenes where he's, like, you know, getting chewed out by his boss, you know, and I'm just like, I, f- I feel for this guy. He's do a terrorist, think, do you, you know? Think, I mean, you think him being uh, chewed out by the uh, leader of the cell is the same as, as the disapproving bourgeois fathers? Uh, yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was, like, correlating that to some degree, just like... Oh man, I really want to. I just want to impress my dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, like, well, I, I mean, but the, he, like, he, he does, be, he does make choices that he's not supposed to make, mm-hmm. and he gets in trouble for it, like, 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 like a, like a child would. Well, I want to ask, I want to ask you, because the way the hostage, the the centerpiece of the movie is they take all of the oil ministers of OPEC hostage while they're meeting in Vienna, mm-hmm. and the goal is. Number the the uh, stated goal is we are going to hijack a plane, not hijack a plane because they it's part of their demands is they get yeah a plane. they get the plane. We're going to fly a plane. We're going to fly all these ministers back to their countries. They're going to release statements in in support of Palestine, and right. then they're free to go. The actual unstated goal is we are going to assassinate one of these ministers because he's going to fuck with oil prices in a way that will be bad for us. Oh or wow, whatever. that's right. Yeah, okay. So yeah, yeah. um, so at any rate, uh, the most important part of this mission is assassinate that one guy. Uh, Carlos does not do it because everything goes to shit and he realizes that they're all going to get themselves killed. Right. Do you think he is being prudent and wise when he instead takes that guy's money and they live to fight another day? Or do you think he is selling out? Mm. 
because that's the argument. He's in charge of the mission, but the two people he's doing the mission with yeah. are ready to die for the cause. And they say, we don't think you're fucking ready to die for the cause. Right. Selling out. So, yeah, I mean, what are all of these Olivia Assius movies are? They're about these anxiety about selling out. Yeah. Something in the air is like a hilarious counterpoint to Carlos because they're the same movie, but one is about a French university student who's a painter and one is about an international terrorist, (laughs) but they're the same fucking movie, which is you have these ideals, but how, as you grow and you age and you mature, do you sacrifice the comfort of your bourgeois lifestyle in order to live those ideals and do, you know, is it, is it only natural that as you get older, you um, sort of shed the fanaticism by the wayside and you try to be more pragmatic? Or is that in fact, you not willing to give up what, what comfort you do have (laughs) for a larger goal and that anxiety about have I, have I sold it's out? How a lot of people live in general, though. It's like right. that sense of, that uh, that guilt and anxiety yeah. about like, have I sold out? Am I fully living to my ideals? Carlos is about that the same way that something in the air is about that. Yeah, um, maybe that's why. Which is I why found I the find common ground. With which this is character. why I find like the this is like why the movie ends the way it does, mm-hmm. and like you you get relatively few like awesome action assassination scenes. It is mostly about him trying to negotiate his position in the sort of global world of international terrorism. Um, And you get this like really funny, like he starts gaining weight and he's just sort of like, yeah, we still got it. They're still after us, man. And it's like 25 years after anything has happened. It's almost like Zodiac where they're just like (laughs) kid. They're already making movies about it. Like, Mm -hmm. um, but they're sort of like, yeah, we're still in our heyday. We're still dangerous. And it's, he's just like teaching a class instead of doing it himself. And it's like, that's fucking, that's, uh, that's a lot of film directors is they end up, you know, teaching film in a university because their, you know, their career didn't go the way they wanted it to. Yeah. Like I, I find the I find the idea of telling a political thriller that is about that character arc specifically really fucking cool and interesting. He went to so many countries in this movie too, man. He, he just keeps getting bounced everywhere. around. That's the thing, you know. It's like a travel log at times. I'm like, geez, Lord, everywhere he goes, it's pretty, it's pretty remarkable. I just can't imagine him taking on a project like this and just rolling with it and being so confident. And it it just feels. Like, like and I've used that word before because it takes a lot of effort to make something like this, but the way it just comes across, it just, it, it, it flows and it feels really, I mean, like I start to, I, I really do care for, for Carlos and what he's going through. And then like, I think, but also he is a rock star piece of shit. In some yeah, ways, Carlos yeah. is the like left wing terrorist version of Oliver Stone's The Doors. Ooh. Oh, no. <laughs> Where he's just like this yeah. like self-involved alcoholic who pushes everyone uh, close to him away because That's he true. is only thinking about himself. So like yeah. the idea that it's like a rock, it follows the rock star biopic arc, but about this terrorist is fucking awesome. That's cool. Yeah. It's a real, I, I'm, I'm going to watch the five hour cut yeah. at some point because I enjoyed this so much and curious. I'm going to watch the Wasp Network at some point. Hmm. We, before we recorded, I was telling you, like, the most exciting thing about finally recording a podcast is that you don't have to keep researching anymore and you can finally move on with your life. I have a stack of DVDs from the library of, like, kung fu movies that I, I want to watch right That's now. That's what you need. Because they're the opposite of fucking French intellectualism. Yeah. So I don't know when I'm going to watch The Wasp Network, but it is on Netflix. And by all accounts, I do think it is something along the lines it of a Carlos. Ju- I think it is just a movie. I'm clicking on it now. It oh, is. My it's bad. It's a two hour movie. something in the air i already talked about it a bit yeah i do think one thing i it's i think it's a very good coming of age story i think it's very discursive and very shaggy and very it's much more personal than a lot of his i mean i think all of his work is very personal in that it could only come from him but it feels a lot more like this is what my life is like and these are memories of mine in a way that not a lot of his other work feels um the thing i think is really interesting is the party scene from the end of cold water happens in something in the air again it's like identical bonfire identical abandoned house but like 
he is now in uh, 2012 instead of uh, 1994. Hmm. And instead of like the super handheld camera, like you are in it, you are immersed in it. You don't even necessarily know what you're looking at at any given frame. Like it is a lot more controlled. More it's a graceful. lot more, you yeah. know, like there's, you know, dollies and a lot more well constructed, not well constructed because they're achieving different things, but a lot more carefully constructed and everything. And that to me is like, Cold water is like feeling like you're that age and something in the air is about looking back at that age. Ah. And it's interesting that the same party plays out in the two movies, but they feel entirely different because the movies are approaching. Well, yeah. And he's in a different place in life. Yeah. That would make sense to reflect that. Right. I yeah. mean, it's, I mean, I, cold water is also a movie about the past and him being reflective. Mm-hmm. It's a, him as an adult looking back sure. at his life, you know, but, but, uh, it's, he's trying to capture the feeling of being in it where something in the air is about uh, hindsight. Um, and so that is the way he films it. And so I thought that was cool, but this was the, yeah, this was the big discovery movie for a lot of people, I think, because the next film clouds of sales, Maria from 2014. Oh boy. Uh, yeah. Something that kind of, again, like expectations played a role, but, but when I first watched this, my feeling was what, I mean, like Kristen Stewart I've always been a fan of going all the way back to Panic Room, but there was just like something otherworldly about how she pl- t- took on this role that it just it surprised so many people, including myself, to come to this conclusion that Kristen Stewart is like a tremendous actress in mm-hmm. every like she's holding her own against Juliette Binoche in this in ways that feel so real and organic and, and perfect, and I think. My my biggest issue to still is like losing that, losing their dynamic. I know the purpose of it. I know what it means for her to leave. I just don't enjoy the rest of it from that point forward as much because I'm so into what Kristen Stewart is doing in this film. Um, but I, I, I guess on the flip side of that, I don't think Chloe Grace Moretz is that strong of an actress to really carry on like her like the the things that she's saying to, you know, Julie Binoche's character towards the end in, in, in the theater. I'm just like, I don't buy it. I don't buy what she is in right. this film as much as Kristen Stewart. So yeah. for Chloe Grace Moretz to fulfill the pu- function that she has to fulfill. Yeah. She has to feel like a credibly up and coming, talented, good actor who is coming to replace Juliet Binoche mm-hmm. and whether or not Juliet Binoche can, settle herself into accepting that she's going to be replaced anyway. It's very all about Eve. Yeah. Um, very much all about Eve. <laughs> yeah. And, and aging and I mean, just what it means to grow up as, you know, like it, it, it's kind of interesting to even just hear you talk about, you know, rendezvous because like that's Juliet Binoche in as the very young mm-hmm. actress in that movie. And now she's coming back to work with Asias as the older actress and playing, you know, an older actress in this movie too. It's really, again, like sort of the, the meta contextual elements of what they're doing in this film is fascinating Mm -hmm. to where, uh, I, I, I kind of just get so caught up in the dynamics of them rehearsing and what it all, like how it's affecting Juliette Binoche's character to actually just kind of come to terms with the fact that she can no longer, uh, just like hold on to the identity that she once had. I mean, all that stuff is really strong in this movie. I, I kind of get over more overwhelmed with it with rewatches, but I also just kind of don't like the choice to to suddenly say, well, it's time for her to, it's time for um, Valentine to become her own person and move on completely because she's essentially experiencing some sort of real intense codependency in this in this dynamic. So they, that's why. I'm guessing that's why she disappears. Yeah. She I mean, wants to go on. Just, just to finish on. my thought, like you need to believe Chloe Grace Moretz is a great actor and you don't. So like yeah. that, that part of the, of the film is sort of non-functional. Some of the, uh, little footage that she watches on, on YouTube of different clips of Chloe Grace Moretz and interviews and stuff. Some of that stuff feels so fucking phony and fake in a way that's like, Oh, like, that talk show with the laugh track? The talk show with the laugh track is just such a fucking bad choice. The again, the the superhero movie clip that we see 
it's contemptuous of superheroes, but not in an observed way. That yeah, is yeah, like yeah. you understand. It's more like when Woody Allen has heavy metal in a in a thing. <laughs> you go, oh yeah, you've never listened to heavy metal in your life. You just know you hate it, um, but you you don't know it well enough to like satirize it. Um, so Olivia he is obsessed with process. Uh, Very much so. You watch something in the air, you're like, this is how, uh, you know, left wing activist, or this is how student activist organizations function. You, you know, you watch Irma Vap, you go, this is how the film industry functions. You watch Carlos, you go, this is how international terrorist cells function. It's all about the process and everything. I think I discovered that about him via Clouds of Sils Maria and the dual. I think the way this movie opens on just like 35 minutes of practical banality yep and the dual realization of he is giving me the thing like he might not be giving you like the cool action scenes that you know fit in the genre in the thriller genre but it turns out the thing that patrick wants to see he is giving me in abundance which is just really nitty gritty nuts and bolts this is how this thing functions yes and that just being starts. handed to me for just like 40 straight minutes combined with the revelation of Kristen Stewart, who people yeah. forget, like Kristen Stewart first broke through really like she was in panic room. She's in other movies and stuff, but I think people really started to notice her with into the wild. I think that was the movie yeah. where she had a supporting role and people were like, That's true. Yeah, you're right. She's only in a yeah. couple scenes, but like you, you just instantly yeah. stand up and you go, wow, look at her. And then people saw twilight movies and go, Oh, never mind. Um, <laughs> It turns out there was a couple of very talented actors in those Twilight movies that did indeed, not get to show indeed. it. Indeed, um, but at any rate, like so, the realization of Kristen Stewart, who when she is at her best, is my favorite contemporary actor. Um, and She's up there, and yeah. that being paired with the nitty gritty, it was just like a rapturous experience seeing her fumble with three cell phones and seeing her self edit because she wants to tell someone on the phone to fuck off, but she has to be like just diplomatic enough mm -hmm. to get this thing to function and seeing all of the processing power and the emotional labor that goes on in every single interaction with Juliette yep. Binoche. And like, she has to constantly worry about the day to day reality of how are we getting to from point A to point B and where and what will be there and everything. And then when she goes into that train cabin and Juliet Binoche is like, have you heard about Google and privacy? I think it's such a shame. And it's just like <laughs> this like broad, meaningless statement. And you're like, these are these two people's That's lives. She how is sometimes the I sound though. <laughs> it's like, no, no, I know. But I'm just saying like after dealing with 10 straight minutes of her you know, uh, dealing with other people's secretaries and assistants mm -hmm. and shit like that, going, going to Juliet Binoche, who's able to just like live in the world and observe it and comment it on yeah. it. And her life is her own, uh, fucking incredible. Yeah. And just like, even just, um, n knowing how to stage and block and, and like on a train and kind of like that, that choice that Juliet Binoche's character makes to go take her phone call, and, and like a separate part of the train and sit in that space. And Kristen Stewart suddenly has to come to that space and invade her space with something really tragic. That whole scene, that whole sequence just real. I like, I get, it's funny to think like, Oh, this is giving me goosebumps, but just like these actors, this director, the writing, everything about this is just like firing on all cylinders for me, but it, it yeah. really is. It's just kind of remarkable. To where, again, yeah, like, once we get to a certain point where that's gone, it's almost like, oh, <laughs> that, that's just on me a little bit more, though. I understand why, like, again, like I mentioned, why it has to happen, but it's also kind of, um, it, it just, it, it makes, it, again, like, sometimes with his endings, they, they don't feel as impactful as I want them to, you know? I really do want something more than what I get out of the ending of summer hours or to some extent cold water, maybe not as much. Irma Vep. Yeah, definitely Irma Vep. I don't know. It's, it's, it's kind of an interesting, like I wouldn't say like, yeah, it peters out or it gets less interesting, but there's just some choice that he makes. I'm kind of like, I wouldn't have made that choice. So therefore it's not what I want. Is it the <laughs> is the is the crazy uh, crane shot on that insane set uh, the final That's, shot of the movie? I think so. So let me tell you no, something. That is cool. I think I think uh, Clouds of Salisbury ends fucking awesome because that crane shot is insane and it like is the insane. reflections and the in the labyrinthian feeling of you know being lost yeah. and like her the identity. I want to go like, see that play. Yeah, yeah. That I don't know how that play would even function. How would you hear the actors with all that fucking glass? Right. <laughs> like 
<laughs> like they just point. built an office building on stage and then people Apparently. are going to have scenes on it. I don't know. Um, but uh, um, I so think, why did it go down for you a little bit? I think that um, the I've already talked about the process, his uh, interest in process and how that mirrors mine and how that how that is sort of intertwined with Kristen Stewart's performance and how that made me rapturous. The yeah. other thing that made me rapturous about this movie is that it depicts modern technology in a way, and I think even more so in personal shopping. Oh, yeah. But both these movies, the way that cell phones and the internet sort of exist, sort of simmer in the background of our lives, and it, the very... Um, casual way that he depicts that like when someone gets a text he just shows the fucking phone screen right. and you see the text and you see people scrolling and they're like looking through the comment section of the article about mm -hmm. the announcement of the director who died and like and when she you know the the scene in eighth grade where she like stays up all night scrolling through her social media feed Juliet Binoche does that but with like the Google image search <laughs> of Chloe Grace Barrett's character That's and true. it's, the, it's yeah. the same inclination it's the same like I think it's something we can relate to Exactly. And I think like Olivier Assias in making a movie like Demon Lover was very uh, prescient into like seeing the world of Internet porn and and seeing like the potential it had. And specifically, you know, he was in influenced by uh, Guy Debord and like uh, uh, Guy Debord and like specifically how that ties into that philosophy and everything. Mm. But the film itself is very reactionary and paints with way too broad a brush and just gets really messy. I think Clouds of Sills Maria, for the most part, again, there's the weird talk show with the laugh track. There's the bad superhero movie scene. Like, I think for the most part, it feels like correct in how technology functions with our lives in a way that yeah. no other movie ever fucking attempts that drives me nuts. This is a common refrain from me because this started back when Trump was elected and, uh, you know, and even it only got more and more intense once COVID hit. But like movies, for the most part, exist in some alternate reality where Trump never happened and COVID never happened. And most American films you see will not. Uh, Trump never happened. COVID never happened. And the human we're race to escape that. Patrick, the, we don't want to acknowledge it. And the human race <laughs> is not going to become extinct from global warming, mm -hmm. which are just like three fundamental things that shape the nature of what it is to be a human being in our current point in time. And those three fundamental things are just totally fucking ignored in most films you watch. And so contemporary film really fucking frustrates me because it always feels like they're starting from a point where they don't want to be that relatable. Mm. And that shit just bothers me so much. And so whenever I do see a movie that is like, here's what it feels like to be a human being right now in this time and place. And I felt that way about uh, Clouds of Sales Maria. And I felt that way about Personal Shopper. Like, it's so exciting to me. And great. Yeah. I'm, I'm being a little ahistorical here because I saw this movie before Trump was elected. I saw this movie. But like, there is this sort of fundamental unwillingness to face reality that a lot of cinema has these days. And I think I feel like all of our best auteurs are extremely scared of making films that don't take place in the past, though I was shocked <laughs> to hear that new Paul Thomas Anderson's new movie is going to be a contemporary movie. I thought for sure. I have and I no believe, idea. I, what that's I think I even, be. I think I even said on this very podcast on the chiming Liang episode, I said, Paul Thomas Anderson will never make a movie where you see a smartphone. <laughs> because I was yeah. so confident that like Quentin Tarantino, he was just going to constantly retreat into making movies that take place in the well, past. Well, I'm confused because even a, a listener of this podcast sent me a message saying, well, we're all hearing that the new Paul Thomas Anderson movie is contemporary, but why is one of the, sh the shots that we're seeing is Leonardo DiCaprio in a phone booth? I'm like, I don't know. I'm, I don't know what that means. I'm sure there are phone booths anyway, in existence. I don't, I'm, but not gonna, I'm not going to hyper-speculate about I don't every know piece what it of information be. that comes out. I'm just yeah. saying, in general, um, Paul Thomas Anderson is someone who I wrote off as will never make a movie about what it means to be a human being in contemporary society. Mm -hmm. And that might still be the case. I haven't seen the new movie. Yeah, you know? we'll see. It, it, it might, you might look at it and go, this has nothing to do with the way our world is. I really want that, though. I want it from all the directors at um, this point. But like also, I, another thing that fucking bothers me a lot in modern film 
is the shorthand that everyone has gone to for people texting is a little bubble appears on screen. I hate that. It it just looks like Man on Fire. It just looks like Tony Scott shit. And it's <laughs> like you aren't going all the way over the top style over substance domino with it. Then you're just breaking the reality of the movie. Is that stuff in like Men, man, men, Women, and Children? Men, Women, and Children by Jason Reitman is yeah. one of the worst offenders I've ever seen. That's what I thought. Um, which you can hear about on 96 Greers on the Now Play Network. Um, but... But this movie and Personal Shopper even more so, the way it depicts texting as a cinematic show thing, the phone with the text um, on it is is so exciting to me. Yeah. Um. And I, and I will say, 2022 Irma Vep, he break he breaks my heart. Oh no! Text bubbles on screen. Uh, one scene. He could have gotten away from it with one scene, but he fucking did text bubbles on screen. Olivier Assias, I believed in you. Anyway, so I <laughs> talked about why I love Clouds of Sales Marie. The reason it has gone down in my esteem is. I've heard people say, like, it's not a movie about anything. And I find that weird because the thing that, that frustrates me about this movie is it is a movie that constantly states what it is about all the time. And I think this kind of gets to he is not as good at writing scripts in English as he is in mm. France, in French. Or maybe he was, like, looking to a different audience. Maybe he's like, oh, Kristen Stewart's in this movie. This is a chance to go towards the mainstream. I'm going to be maybe a little less uh, enigmatic. But, like, it's just people talking about Juliette Binoche. You're an actor and you're getting older. And for actresses in the industry, once you get older, you operate a different sphere. And she's like, but I don't want to operate that different sphere. It's like, but you have to. You don't have a choice. And it's like, and because the, the world's changing around you. And yeah. it's like. Everybody's saying that to her. <laughs> and so the mo- the thing that the movie's actually about, I like I like that it's a movie about that. And I think Juliette Binoche is good in it. And I care about her. And I, and I do think there's plenty of things that hit from odd angles. It's not like totally watered down and mainstream. But. I find all of that stuff really tedious because it is so just on its nose the thing that it is about. I and agree. In, I've seen, this is a movie I watched like five times uh, when it came out and it never bothered me. But on this like seventh or eighth rewatch, that was when I was finally like, you know what? This is actually not that interesting. Um, and I do think, like Maggie Chung leaving Irma Vep, I do think the movie is better with Kristen Stewart than without Kristen Stewart. Yes. But I don't, it doesn't bother me because at this point we are reaching uh, an interesting section of the movie, which is how Juliette Binoche sort of adjusts. And I do like when she, you find, suddenly see her new assistant and it is like, I guess she's grown because she's no longer in this toxic codependent relationship with her assistant. It's very mm-hmm. professional and cold. <laughs> Yeah, but I I don't know. There is something about portrayals of toxic codependency that always speak to me and really get to me and always like immediately just go, yeah, I understand how that happens in life with people, especially when, you know, they've been through something. And it's not like we, I don't know if we know a whole lot about Valentine and her past as much as we know about um, Julie Pinoche's character. But there is just something about them two together both maybe it is just a matter of two, like being like, oh, I love Julie Pinoche, I love Kristen Stewart, and here they are together acting, and you know the the, the meta t- contextual elements are really heavy <laughs> in this movie, to where they're like, you know, you could see this as Kristen Stewart commenting at times on being in Twilight. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Know? When she is defending and, and Chloe Grace Moretz's character, it yeah, often reads yeah. like Kristen Stewart defending herself. Exactly. Um, I also think this is fascinating in the way that Irma Vep, the shape of the thing is reflective of the thing, mm-hmm. of the subject matter itself. I think it is very fascinating that Juliet Binoche and Kristen Stewart are such different actors. Yes. Kristen Stewart's technique uh, I have learned in an interview is she wants to barely learn her lines and her style is she wants as a character to be searching for the thing to say. And so her as an actor wants to have to search for her lines. And so that's why a lot of the way she delivers dialogue, especially in movies where she is able to be more naturalistic, it doesn't fit in every context. I'm sure she's not this way in the Charlie's angels movie or whatever, but like she'll, they'll be stuttering. they will be mumbling. they will be sharp intake of breath before she delivers a line. It's yeah. very naturalistic. It's very compelling. And it's very new. And Juliet Binoche is like, I want to do 15 takes. I want to try it from all these different angles. I want to really think about it. I want to know every part of every angle of the scene. I need to... They're coming at it from very different places. And so we are actually like... The origin of Clouds of Sales Maria is Olivier Assias being like, I want to make a project just for you, Juliet Binoche. And I want to comment on your career and we're going to have lunch together and you're going to tell me about what's going on and I'm going to go home and I'm going to write a script. And 
And so it's like the genesis of that is like, I've built this for you, Juliet Binoche. But the result of that is everyone going, look at Kristen Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Juliet Binoche got plenty of good notices from this film, too. But like the result of this movie is everyone going, look at Kristen Stewart. Yeah. And I think the fact that that happened in real life as a product of this story is fucking awesome. And yet it's a love letter to Juliet Binoche, too. Yeah, That's yeah, no, I, I mean, it's not just that, you know. Yeah, uh, and that, that to me is like, I if this movie went the opposite tact, and it was like, if the weird elliptical thing he did was Juliet Binoche drops out of the movie, and we instead follow Kristen Stewart's character as she figures out what to do after being this person's personal assistant, and she has to sort of define herself. Like, that's another story you could tell. And yeah. like, maybe it's a story that would have more of the more compelling actor in it, but like, that would be a betrayal of the of what the movie is fundamentally about, which is B- Juliet Binoche's character. Right. So that's, yeah. So and anyway. it happens in the play. Like they even say like the character in that movie disappears or in the play disappears. Oh. You want to like, talk about feeling uh, insecure uh, after watching a movie and, and not responding to it the way you thought you would. Um, the play is based off of the bitter tears of Petra von Kant. Oh, um, it is. He didn't want to just like take dialogue from the Renner Werner Fassbender film, but uh, that is the basic and the, and the bitter tears of Petra von Kant has, I forget the names of the actors, but basically there is this like assistant slash maid character who is following around the diva, uh, sort of melodramatic character for the whole movie. And she doesn't say anything. And Mm. the, the final thing of the movie is about her leaving, uh, finally Uh. leaving her. And like, so the nature of clouds of Sils Maria is inspired by bitter tears of Petra von Kant and the play they're doing is a version of bitter tears of Petra, Petra von Kant in a way. Okay. Um, I watched that movie, uh, five star masterpiece by many fucking hated it. So oh, interesting. <laughs> I, I felt, I felt well, very insecure and depressed after I watched bitter tears of Petra von Kant. There and I were went, a I guess couple I'm dumb. of fast bender movies where I just, Again, like complete disconnect. Where yeah. I get, I, like, why am I not engaging with yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. I'm a cinephile. I should get in. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> that I was can't. this one for me. But anyway, yeah. uh, it, when we talk about Olivier Assis as a cinephile, as a cinephile uh, director who makes movies inspired by other movies, Bitter Tears of Petra von Kant is in the DNA of mm-hmm. Clouds of Sils Maria. Okay. My latest rewatch of Personal Shopper, I was high. So yeah, let, you let, were. Let me say, my thoughts on this while watching it. I'm like, some movies I think are just hard to say why I love them so much because I just feel them, and let me feel them. Words are going to fail me to the point where I, I had this thought in my head. I'm like, what if art wasn't meant to be podcasted about and scrutinized? You're just supposed to experience it and let it take over you. <laughs> which was a horrible thing to think about because I host a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Cause I'm like, I'm meant to talk about it. I'm meant to think about it. I'm meant to intellectualize. I'm meant to figure out what, what means what, and you know, say, this is why I love this movie so much. But then while I'm watching this movie, what, what we do here is put uh, subjective experiences into objective terms. Yes, exactly. You are nailing it. That's exactly what movies should be about. No, I'm like, no, that's not that's what <laughs> movies should be about. I'm saying that's what our podcast right, is about. That's, yeah, that's what I meant. Uh, but then I was like thinking, like, okay, maybe the purpose of art is just to stir feelings in you that you normally, like, the, the fe- these feelings stay asleep during our waking hours because we're doing other things or we're thinking about other things. And here are these movies; they're personal. You're going to experience them the way you're going to experience them. And so, like, I'm watching this and I'm having like all these deep thoughts and just thinking, like, God, what if I'm doing? What if I'm just approaching art in a completely wrong way to where I'm like, I got to be taking notes. I got to know what to say on the podcast. Like, ah, you know, and 
nah, I just want to feel it. I just want to let this movie like take me over. And it kind of does like, as I'm watching it, like it's a movie about being haunted and I feel haunted by this movie. So it really just, cause I can't even explain like, cause I, I went online and tried to, figure out, well, what do people think about what happens? Right. You know, Maybe someone minutes. else has given voice to this thing that I can't put words to. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so like when suddenly the elevator doors are opening by themselves and the, the door, uh, the entrance doors to the hotel are opening by themselves. Am I supposed to think that Kristen Stewart's character was killed and this is her ghost or was that her brother's ghost? I don't know what to make of like logically in my brain, I can't go. This is what the definitive... logical argument that she was killed. No, I don't think so. But some people thought that. And really? I was, yeah. I was like, how would that make sense? And then because what, is we the, see what her... do they think the rest of the movie is? The, that's the thing that the, the, eventually they would go. Well, actually, she's interacting with human beings out. You know, she's right. talking with her friend at the restaurant afterwards. So that doesn't hold water either. Right. So, but I mean, it's like it, it is just a really fascinating encapsulation of longing for something and you don't know even what it is. And you also just feel sad that you lost somebody in your life that you were so close to. So, I mean, again, dealing with loss, like her fear of getting the same disease that's there for me too, wanting to reconnect, uh, but also being very distracted by all these text messages. I mean, it makes, it just feels like the most relatable movie of for me even though i'm not a i'm not a personal shopper i'm not a personal assistant I you do not live in the world of luxury no i certainly don't and the ultra wealthy no and i've never you know came to, and like found my boss murdered and like the the little murder story or the mystery that comes into fruition throughout this movie may not be the strongest element but everything surrounding it's just like oof it really like i mean the final scene of this movie works so much for me that i kind of like yeah, I almost like have an existential crisis afterwards. So I don't know. This 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 and Cold Water to me are so close to being my favorites. Uh, it's just and Kristen Stewart's performance is phenomenal. So I mean, I I just I love it. And sometimes some some movies I can't say this is precisely why I love it. I just love it. Mm -hmm. And that's how I felt from the first time I watch it. It's only getting stronger as time goes on. So my memory of this movie. I was like, and it's ambiguous whether or not there's a ghost. I forgot there's like three CGI oh, yeah, ghosts. There's, there's, there is. <laughs> I never thought in a million years Olivia Essie has to make a yeah. movie with fucking CGI ghosts. It's like, oh, James Wan all of a sudden here. <laughs> hey, personal shopper, the Frozen Empire. It's like, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it's like, what, are, what is going on? Yeah, the, the little James Wan there. Uh, I've seen this she called. She even says ectoplasm at one point or something. Right? I, have, I, have <laughs> seen, I have seen this uh, lumped in with the world of the A24 horror movie. And it's like, this mm. is not a fucking horror movie. No. I, again, um, depiction of texting, depiction of yes, like. Yes, yes, yes. There, there's a line in this movie that is like. You talk about like wanting to stand up and cheer during the big speech in 25th hour or whatever. The thing that makes me want to stand up and cheer in this movie is I forget the name of the movie, but if you go on YouTube and you search yes. Victor Hugo turning tables TV movie, you'll find it. Like yep. that is a thing that no one in movies ever says, but I say three times a day. Yeah. <laughs> and her doing other things with the laptop while watching a YouTube video right. or whatever. She's like yeah. watching on her phone and then she's yeah. picking up the movie later on her yeah. laptop. Like that fucking shit. Again, just in terms of like casually depicting the world as it actually is con currently, fucking awesome and incredible. Yeah. I think this movie makes no sense as a thriller. I don't I, understand why on earth she would be texting this guy the way she is. And like that whole thing about her getting like, I really like. I don't know why she didn't block him from the beginning. But right. hey. And then at the beginning, she's like, are you the ghost of my brother? And it's like nothing about this sounds like it would be the ghost of your brother. And mm -hmm. like. And then, like, she gets caught into... She just wants so hard to believe that he's reaching out to her. I know, but, like, she has all these other ways that she actually legitimately reaches out to the dead. That the idea that her brother would be texting her and then texting her weird shit that her brother wouldn't say. <laughs> like, it just... It makes no sense to me. And so, like... And then also, there is just a... I've seen this movie three times and I fundamentally don't fucking know what happens in the hotel room. I don't either. Like it's and not in a and it kind of bothers not in me a that compelling I life. It does bother me. Yeah. I, not in a not in a compelling, oh, it's interesting in an enigmatic way, but mostly in a what the fuck? Whatever. Yeah, and I'm, but I'm watching it like, yeah, huh? What? Why? So, um, Why? But I mean I, I don't I, know if it bothers me as much. It's just kind of like 
what am I supposed to get out of that? That that choice to not right. show what happens and then the doors opening by themselves. And I'm like, is that supposed to be a ghost? What now, you want to talk about like great moments in, in modern thrillers when she turns her phone back on and then she gets all the texts at once and oh, it's like, God. I'm closer, I'm coming up the door, yeah. I'm on the landing. That's it's perfect. fucking awesome. I know. It's so good. The thing that I find really compelling about this movie is A, just depiction of modern times. B, there is this really interesting thing that uh, is back in the news now, I guess, because apparently, you know, the the right wing uh, media circuit that will find things to be mad at to justify their misogyny or whatever. They were mad about Kristen Stewart's Rolling Stone uh, oh God. magazine cover where she is dressed like very masculine, wearing a jock strap or whatever in a men's mm-hmm. locker room. And they're like, oh, there's women. It's, you know, gender, blah, or whatever. Um, and which is just like, yeah, whatever. You're just promoting their movie, her movie for her. So good yeah. for you. But um, uh, I think Kristen Stewart is a really fat. She's a cis woman. She is bisexual, but she is a cis woman. But I feel like if you look at her body of work, there is a lot of gender play going on obviously there's the j uh, jt Leroy movie that she is that's like the uh, most literal version of that um I can't remember if i saw that where she plays the person who has to pose as jt Leroy right um for photos and stuff and in doing so discovers that uh she is non-binary mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. like and, and so that is like in pulling off this scam discovers something about themselves. Like that is the most clear version of that. But I think to a certain extent, clouds of sales Maria is about like her dressing down and dressing butch because she is sort of, she does, she is young and beautiful, but like Juliet Binoche is supposed to be the gorgeous, beautiful one. <laughs> so like in, in, uh, in placating Juliet Binoche's ego, she has to sort of constantly dress like masculine. And like when they jump in, into the lake to swim together, she's wearing like very plain unrevealing underwear. And then later when Juliet Binoche sees her get home from a date, she's like wearing a thong or whatever. And it's like, there's what she chooses to wear in front of you. And then there's wh- who she actually is. And there's like an element of play of gender and stuff like that. And I think personal shopper is a movie about her having a twin brother. And part of the way that her twin brother is contacting her is it almost feels to me, the implication being like, she is sort of becoming her brother. Like she's almost possessed by her brother at points. And like, there is the, times where she is like in her day to day life, she is dressed very butch and very masculine, but like she is sort of in this personality crisis and she's dressing in these like very high femme, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, dresses and lingerie and stuff that her, she's uh, boss owns doing and that. stuff like yeah. that. There is, and there, her, the weird, whatever psych undeveloped, underdeveloped, I would say psychosexual game that she has with the mysterious stranger who, uh, uh, a common phrase used on my favorite film podcast, uh, The Suspense is Killing Us, Yay. is the economy of characters, which is like, you know who the killer's going to be because oh, there yeah. are five people in this movie right, and that's right. the only one it could be. The economy of characters means that there's no point where it is ever a mystery who the person texting her is because yeah. there's no one else in the fucking movie to do it. Oh, of course. Um, yeah. So like, that's another way the thriller part just doesn't work, but like the weird psychosexual games she has with uh, her boss's um, uh, boyfriend uh, also feels like to be a weird gender play sort of a thing. I think Kristen Stewart is very interesting uh, in terms of being a major movie star at this point in history who. Uh, sort of explores gender dynamics on screen without um, calling attention to it necessarily. Well, you know, it's like this is you know, it's not uh, 2006 anymore. You 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 can't hire uh, what's her name, a college scandal, to be a trans woman. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mark Ruvalo learned that the hard way. <laughs> um, but uh, but so it's not as if uh, Chris Stewart is playing transgender people or whatever. But like her on-screen character and her persona is about beautiful, petite young woman, but husky voice, but, you know, but, like, famous movie star, but uh, bisexual, you know, very queer, and, Mm -hmm. like, she... I find her to be a really interesting figure for these times, um... And Love's Lives Bleeding is another movie, oh, another you, you another should, point should, on that fucking chart. You should chart. see it. You should see it. Yeah, I'll I, see it eventually. I hate St. Maud, so I'm not excited to see it, but... Um, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, again, I'm indifferent. I, I understand why people love it. I just, again, yeah. yeah. But at any rate, I think personal shopper was where my theory of, my Kristen Stewart gender theory started to come into focus. Yeah. Uh, so well, that is another element butch of this like, movie. Underwater, right? Was that the movie that she did with Oh, yeah, yeah. Underwater. She's she's very butchered underwater. Yeah, she's got a shaved head. It's awesome. Right. I didn't watch it because it looked terrible. But... <laughs> that's, the thing. that's the thing about difference between me and you is you will see a movie that you're not interested in because an actor you love is in it. And I am the person who just said that Kristen Stewart is my favorite contemporary actor. And I see maybe 10 percent of the movie. She said, oh, yeah, well, um, you don't think it's going to be worth your time or if you don't. Right. Think it'll be, yeah, it I don't sense. have I, I'm a disloyal bitch. Uh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's who I am. Anyway, I'm loyal to a fault. But so no, um, I think I just again, like by the end of this movie, I feel so much. And yet I can't even tell you why. It's so it's just like a. Because I, I I I get I get where you're coming from, and I completely understand like the thriller element, the mystery element. I mean, it's not even a mystery. Why am I even using that right, word? Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's just it gestures vaguely towards a mystery. Yeah. And even just like, who's that ghost? And like Clouds of Sills Maria, a lot of the dialogue is her just stating the theme of the film mm-hmm. uh, in a way that I am not a huge fan of. Um, so I, I, I really like this movie. I think it's cool. Again, like it's the Olivia SES thing where part of the thing I'm responding to is the weird, um, unusual shape of the movie itself. Yeah. Um, that's where it works for me too. I would say, which, just, it, which doesn't always work for you, but in this yeah. case, it just, everything clicked for yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, again, that's, this is a movie that made me excited to see what, what else he's done and what he's capable of. And certainly moving forward, um, it's 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 weird because like again nonfiction is something that I couldn't completely engage with because it just felt like the same old stuff from him like it was very it did feel like a Woody Allen or a Nicole Hollis Center movie where it was very talky about you know publishing and 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 authors and of course they're all narcissists of course they're all having affairs you know but at the same time he's making direct commentary through dialogue about ebooks. And audiobooks mm-hmm. and physical media sliding in and out of prominence and like it's going to be the death of of art the artistic process to not actually hold a book in your hands mm-hmm. you know like that sort of vibe because a lot of these people are just very self absorbed. I like a lot of the things that they're talking about and I understand like the fears, even just being a librarian, I get those fears of like what's going to happen to the future of books, what's going to happen to the future of media in general, you know, because I am one of those people now that is becoming more hyper aware of like streaming is clearly lesser than and I follow a lot of people who are just like so insane about physical media and I get that and I understand it and I certainly try my best to buy what I can but it's just, it's a it's a movie that I think, if I hadn't watched a bunch of his other movies before this, maybe it would have resonated a little bit more strongly. But to me, it was just like, yeah, this is an Aseas statement. Um, but instead of like technology or the internet or filmmaking, it's writing itself or, you know, a, an author struggling with what does it mean to write books now that all these right. other things exist in the world? Which again might be prescient. Uh, like this, it is could a, be. Yeah. This is a 2018 movie. Ask any author in the past 18 months how it has been trying to get your book noticed in an yeah. Amazon marketplace where AI is flooding everything. I know. I'm and terrified like, of that too. People are. Do you remember that? Uh, what's the Roger Ebert or Siskel and Ebert book that came out? recently? Oh yeah, the, the Matt Singer book. Yeah. Yeah. Did you hear what happened with his book? Where AI just yep. rewrote it, and and Amazon's like, nope, that's valid. I think yeah, it it re- I wrote a summary. I think like like because some people are lazy and just like, oh, just give me the Cliff's Notes. I don't want to uh-huh. have to read the whole book. Give me Cliff's Notes. So Amazon provides like summaries that are like you know thirty pages, forty pages long of the book. And I feel that, like I thought it was I, someone was selling a rewritten version of his book on Amazon. I don't know if it was the whole book. I don't think it was Amazon itself that did it. I think no, it, I think no. what it was is the book, the book as, as listed on the Amazon marketplace was summary of yes. Roger Ebert, Gene Siskel, best of enemies or whatever the fuck that, that book was called. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's what I imagine. Opposable thumbs. I think opposable thumbs. There we go. That's a better title. Fair, yes. fair, fair play to Matt <laughs> Singer. You did a better title than I did. Um, uh, but like basically someone was selling their version of his book. And when he contacted right. Amazon about it, they said, nah, it's valid. And like, so 
you know, maybe maybe SES is right to say once we lose our connection to the physical things, we lose our we lose our ability to discern what is and yeah. isn't real, and, and how it affects even just how we interact and our interpersonal mm-hmm. relationships. I get that too. Um, very talky. Is it? Is it? When you say Woody Allen, is it funny? Yeah, it's it's breezy. It, I mean, like to me, it was like it felt like like slight, but also there were funny bits of dialogue here and there. I didn't jot any down, but it was more just like, yeah, this feels like a kind of more of like a, just a hangout movie with people having interesting conversations. Um, just a lot of intellectual conversations, but also characters that are so like, so self-involved to the point where I'm just like, all right, I don't know. I, I like, I'm not getting a strong connection with you as a fully, hu- a full human being with certain like issues. It's more just like, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of lost, and so I'm going to have affairs kind of a thing. <laughs> I don't know, you know? And I feel like I've seen that movie a lot of times where it's just people decide, like, I can't fill the void I'm feeling. I'm going to have an affair with this younger um, publisher or, or my, my assistant in this case. You know, I think that's, that's the Woody Allen angle I got sometimes is just the author itself not feeling fulfilled. So mm-hmm. might as well try and connect with somebody else that hopefully feels you know, similar to me as opposed to my spouse, that kind of thing. So yeah, it's, but it's, it's still interesting to, because the people, the stuff that they're talking about is interesting. And Mm -hmm. I understand like the concerns that we are currently faced with. And you mentioned AI and I'm, I went to a, like a little uh, conference, online conference where it was AIs and the future AI and the future of libraries and people there were like so gung ho about it. And I was like, I'm not at all. What, what, why would we want this? You know, it's like, we talk about how librarians are so dependent on Google to come up with the answer now. Well, what is AI going to be going to be ultimately? It's going to be that only probably worse. Well, the thing, the thing that it is, is this is all, this is already our contemporary reality. Yes. Google is fucked now because there are so many AI written articles. This there are. Um, you, I mean, there, I've, I've heard instances of like people trying to look up the instruction manual for a specific like washing machine or whatever that they have. They don't have the instruction manual anymore. You go, well, someone probably uploaded it to, and they Google it. Yeah. And it's like AI will gladly write a fake version of the instruction manual that does not apply at all to your needs and then call it the same thing so they can get the hit that, uh, in your search. You know what I mean? Like the, you, it writes movie reviews, but the actors aren't even in the movie. Right. You know, so it's terrible. I, uh, eBay, it's very flawed. eBay used to have a big database. And when you were selling a copy of Batman, they would say, oh, are you talking about the snap cover DVD right, from 1998? Right, right. And you'd go, yes, I am talking about the snap cover. And they go, all right, well, we know all the details of that. eBay does not have that anymore when you sell. What eBay has instead is in the description, they go, would you like AI to write that <gasps> uh, description for you? And it's... Very time consuming and irritating, especially if you're trying to sell a bunch of shit like I've been on eBay to write it. So sometimes I have clicked. I'm like, all right, what do you got? And they're just like this criterion collection. I'm like, nope, that's wrong. It's like, it's an adventure story. And I'm like, this is not an adventure story. I'm so like, oh, God, it's just folk. It's just fake and phony and horrible. I am 100 percent against A.I. In, there's there was versions of large language models that could have been fun and useful mm-hmm. and like interesting tools and toys for human beings to play with, but that is not the reality we live in anymore. So I'll just state on here like never use AI for art, never use AI for text, never use AI for anything. If you do, you are making the world a worse place. And I mean you, the person listening to me right now. Oh yeah. So that's my take. But I went, I went through a brief phase of doing the thing that everybody was doing on an app or whatever, and then I just stopped because I started to feel like this is gonna, this is not good. You're training it. I feel bad enough yeah, that yeah, like there are things exactly. that I try to log into, and then they're like, okay, you know the username and password, but can you train our AI to know what a bicycle is? And you have to click on the three pictures of a bicycle, and mm-hmm. it's like you're just having me train something I fucking want to tear down. Yeah, but like I have to log into my fucking account, so I guess I will. <laughs> Sucks. <laughs> The All world, right. The world's terrible now. Speaking of the world's terrible now, uh, Irma Vep, the TV series. He, no, we don't have to talk about that. Olivier some more, do we? <laughs> might be, he might be terrible now, for all I know. But um, yeah. Uh, so we don't have. We didn't we, see Wasp Network and suspended. I've time already isn't talked out enough yet. about Irma Vep. Suspended time is done. So I do think we are. Um, I think I think we're we, good. Yeah, we've we've talked broadly. We don't necessarily have any more final thoughts about Olivier Assis. I think we have talked broadly about his career throughout. Um, yeah. Summed it up. 
His I, uh, 10 favorite films from the 2012 Sight and Sound Directors poll are 2001, A Space Odyssey, The Gospel According to St. Matthew, Ludwig, A Man Escaped, Mirror, Napoleon, Playtime, The Rules of the Game, The Tree of Life, and Van Gogh. That's how I'll end it. Okay, sure. <laughs> I, guess, I know I you it, love lists I can, of I can favorite go, movies. I can go back and say... I implied Olivier Assius is a creep, uh, and I actually know nothing about his relationship with Mia Hansen Love or anything. Yeah, so yeah, I want to yeah. go. I want to walk that back. What I do want to say is, I got so fucking tired of listening to the way he writes women, and specifically certain scenes in the 2022 Irma Vep, where it is just him being like. What do you can't do a rape scene no more? You, I want to do a rape scene, and it's like, but everyone's so sensitive now. And like, there's shit like that that uh, made me uh, cynical and um, mm. assume the worst about him. But it's not actually based in anything, so I'll walk that back. He might be a perfectly nice guy. Seems like a decent guy. Why do you say knows? that? Well, just just the one podcast interview I heard with him with Kelly Reichardt. I'm like, oh, he seems all right. He seems nice. Mm-hmm. He's very complimentary to Kelly. Okay. I don't know if that means anything at all. Because you're on a podcast, of course you're going to be complimentary to whoever you're talking to. Certainly you are. <laughs> what are you <laughs> that's, that's the Jim Laskowski yeah. special is five minutes of flattery. Yeah, that's true. Patrick, you're the best. <laughs> oh, I love it. Thank yeah. you so much, Jim. You're, you're good, too. You're such a good podcaster. And you also have an essay coming out, don't you? On a, uh, for uh, Yes, let me bring up that. Uh, let me that. tell you my top three Olivier Asias films. Please do, Jim, while I look this up. Number three is Clouds of Sils Maria, number two, Cold Water, and number one, Personal Shopper. But man, one and two could be depending on when I'm watching them and how I'm feeling, because I love them both pretty much equally. So I um, I didn't pick my top three, and in fact, I was thinking to myself last night, boy, it's going to be hard picking your top three, because usually there's one undisputed masterpiece that you know is your favorite, mm-hmm. and then there's two others that you could probably choose between. But in all of these, I have almost all of them. I have a lot of respect for the movies, but none of them, I think, are masterpieces. I think I'm going to say that Cold Water is number one. I think Irma Vep for me is number two. And I do think Clouds of Sils Maria is number three. Yes, that is. That would make sense. Carlos could Carlos could squeeze in there maybe. Yeah, let's um, watch the five hour version. And see. I think so, I think something in the air is excellent. I think okay. I definitely. I'll go back and watch that. Uh, recommend that. Um, I have a essay about the 1990s bizarre uh, horror movie uh, Monster Mash Winter Beast <gasps> in the Ghastly Horror Society Compendium Volume One which Klon Waldrip, who is a prominent zine writer, uh, put together. Um, he asked if uh, I wanted to do... Or he didn't ask me personally, but he put out a request, and I, I said, can I write about Winter Beast? He said, yeah, totally. So anyway, awesome. I, was flatter- I was flattered to be included in this. Uh, if you go to clon.bigcartel.com, you can pre-order it. I think it's going to be pre-order only, so if you miss it, you miss it. Um, I but uh, on that. I'm very excited to be in the Ghastly Horror Society Compendium Volume 1 uh, writing about that. There's going to be a lot of cool art and other people who are smarter than me writing essays. Mm, Congratulations on that. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm really happy with uh, when smart people like you and and Bill get to contribute to things. That's good. I also love (laughs) contributing to things. Yes. Put it on my tombstone. Uh, Contributed to things. I'm a thing contributor. You do well. You do that thing well. Isn't that what Ariana said about uh, Angela Bassett for one of those award shows? Oh, maybe. Yeah. Her line was, Angela Bassett did the thing. That was that was the line. Like she had to oh. come up with a rhyme like pretty quick for on an award show. So she's right. just like, Angela Bassett did the thing. That was it. What do you think the thing was? Uh, acted in a movie. I think that's that's what she meant. Re- remade <laughs> Ali Fear Eats the Soul with Whoopi Goldberg. Yeah. Well. That's a, I saw a double feature of Ali Fear Eats the Soul and How Stella Got Her Groove Back. It's not a remake of. Tell that. people about that awesome podcast that you're. Oh, you mean 96 Greer's on the Now Playing Network, a film where we watch every feature film, but with Judy Greer in the cast, me and my partner Reg have been going through the highs and mostly lows of Judy Greer's career. Mm. Um, It's a really fun podcast. Every movie we talk about is an excuse to talk about uh, a, a broad trend in film. Um, we, it's a really interesting career cause she only plays or mostly plays smaller parts in movies. 
uh, the the genesis behind the podcast was when you are watching a movie and you see that her name is in the opening credits. You almost it's almost always a surprise because she's not the reason you're watching any movie, but you go. Oh, Judy Greer's in this. And then you're like, feel a little bit more confident that something's going to go well because she's so great. Yeah. So 96 Greer's is our podcast. We recently did an episode on Jason Reitman's terrible yeah. men, women and children. You want to talk about Olivier Assias being reactionary about Internet culture. You ain't seen nothing yet until you've seen men, women and children. But don't watch it. It sucks. Instead, listen to us laugh about Ansel Elgort body slamming Timothy Chalamet onto a lunch table. It's fun. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah. I love the show. It's a great, 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 great show. Thank you. Yeah, I'm enjoying it very much so. I love the I love the games or I love the little yes segments. we always we talk about the movies and then we every time whole cloth invent a new segments and so it turns into a weird like doctor game show sort of a thing where we have to invent uh, new weird games every every week and we get more and more desperate so that's that's a fun ongoing reading letterboxed well. reviews loved it <laughs> no I did it was fun. I mean especially since a lot of them were wacky mm-hmm. but yeah no everybody stay tuned. Lots of good things to come. My birthday month. So, uh, ChicagoCriticsFilmFestival.com. You got to come out. Music Box Theater rules. And there's going to be some great films that have played Sundance, South by Southwest, and other festivals that uh, you'll get to see pretty early on before most people get to. So, that's always exciting. And then, like I said, Bill Ackerman will return. Uh, to talk some more favorite movies because we love to do that. Mm -hmm. And it'll be a trilogy of terror, Uh, a trilogy of favorites, we'll say. And then, uh, yeah, the next official episode will be towards the end of May. Right in time for Memorial Day, Jeremy Saulnier will be the director next. So go go to directorsclubpodcast.com. Send us an email, directorsclubpodcast at gmail.com, and just follow us on all the socials. You know where to go. That whole thing, the blue sky, the Twitter, all that stuff. I don't know what any of it is anymore. Letterboxd, all that. Yeah. Yeah. Go there. Go there if you like. Absolutely. I'm Uptown Song Club on uh, Blue Sky and on Instagram as well. So that's where you can follow me. Thank you, Patrick. Now let's go for a hike in the mountains and uh, see if one of us disappears. Oh, yeah. You go ahead. Go ahead. All right. I'll be somewhere by you. Okay. Sounds good. Come on!